Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, it's a lovely day out there. It's great to see the sun uh, finally come out after a few days of rain, and uh, it looks like we have some uh, very wonderful guests in the in the gallery today, uh, uh, Mad Madam Speaker, and uh, I uh, have the very important guests with us today and that deserve recognition, and uh, Caitlin and Megan Rogers are here today, and they are the 2023 Easter Seals. And they're joined by uh, Kelly Mullally, and uh, Director of Easter Seals of PEI, and other guests, and we welcome you here today to the proceedings. And uh, as the Minister of Environment uh, lifted the fire ban yesterday because of all the rain, uh, we still want everyone to be uh, very mindful, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, keep in mind the fire smart tips and uh, general fire safety. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today and welcome those who are watching online and those to the gallery today, and, and especially to our Easter Seals ambassadors, uh, Caitlin and Megan Rogers. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the other guests today, too. Also uh, to, to Kelly Mullally. Nice to see you again. Kelly at uh, one time was the executive director with uh, the uh, PI4H Council. I know she did a wonderful job there, and she does a wonderful job in her new role, too. So thank you for, for coming in today. Um, Madam Speaker, tonight I will have the honor of uh, rev being the reviewing officer for the uh, 641 Squadron Air Cadets uh, in West Prince. So I asked, what am I supposed to be doing? But they said, just look pretty. So I might have to leave early to get prepared. <laughs> but anyway, the Air Cadets, it's a premier youth group in Canada. And they do wonderful work. And they really uh, uh, have a great uh, group of young um, individuals who can give back to, not only to the community, but can give back to the country, and it can lead on to so many other great things uh, in their life. So it's a wonderful program. Their motto is to learn, to serve, and to advance. And so I look forward to, um, to um, inspecting the squadron and to presenting a few awards tonight. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the folks in the gallery. I, too, would like to uh, make particular welcome and uh, to Caitlin and Megan Rogers, who are this year's uh, Easter Seals ambassadors. So lovely to see you here. And I know that your motto is believe in yourself and don't give up. And I have, I'm hoping I'm allowed to say this, but a good friend of mine is Perry Williams. And I know that Perry has sat down with you on a couple of occasions and worked on a beautiful song which incorporates the both parts of that motto. And uh, I don't know if it's been released yet, but it's a fantastic little catchy tune and, and they, uh, both girls are involved in that. So congratulations to you and I hope you have a fantastic time as ambassadors for the Easter Seals. And uh, thank you, Kelly, of course, for all the work that, that you're doing uh, with this project as well. I'd also like to recognize Gerard DeVoe, who's in the back in the back row, and also Norma Dingwell, who joins us this, today from uh, Montague and runs the, well, runs a whole bunch of things in Montague, including the food bank there. And thank you for the work that you do, Norma. I also want to take a moment to wish a happy birthday to Paul Wisner. Paul is the grandfather of Nate Hood, who works in our office, and Paul uh, lives in Charlottetown, and he turns 87 today. So happy birthday to you, Paul Wisner. Uh, I, I hope I consider myself to be a, an optimistic, upbeat person, Madam, Madam Speaker, and I'm always looking for silver linings in clouds. And uh, you know, Fiona, of course, wreaked such destruction across our province, but there was a story yesterday about a little silver lining related to that, and that's Fiona created some extra habitat for our piping plovers here across the province. Not, uh, routine, not everywhere, but in some beaches, it's exposed some cobble, which is uh, a good nesting uh, habitat for piping plovers, and of course, a very endangered species here on the island. And we typically get 35 or so breeding pairs on PEI, and I know the Island Nature Trust would love to see that number raised to 60 or so. Uh, so far this year, they've identified 20 birds and four nests, and but we're a little early to have the final numbers. I hope that's obviously not where we are. Um, but again, Fiona, where it wreaked havoc everywhere else and created all kinds of destruction, um, it has allowed piping plovers a little bit more extra habitat, and that's a good thing. And uh, although, as 
first, Lindsay Burke with the Parks Canada and Shannon, uh, Shannon Mader, who's with the Island Nature Trust, are quick to point out the threat here to piping plovers is not a, an absence or a lack of habitat, it's human interference and sometimes predation as well. But this is a, it's a, it's a good story and I, I'm just happy to see that. Uh, another good story is two brothers, Jesse and Eli Anderson, they live on the McAdam Road in Morrell. And uh, starting, I think it was in 2020, they put a bin in front of their house on the road, encouraging people not to litter. Um, they'd been out on their bikes and they'd seen all kinds of garbage um, on the road in front of their house and around and about their community. And people have, for years now, been dropping off cans and bottles and other things in this container that they've put at the end of their drive. And uh, they're only 12 and 14 years old, but they're obviously leaders in their community, and I want to thank Jesse and Eli for the work they're doing. As Eli says, they just want to do, we, we just want to do our little part, and they certainly are. They're a real inspiration to, to us. So thank you, Jesse and Eli, for, for what you're doing. Um, talking of inspiring people, my son Dan, uh, we have four kids, and Dan is our youngest, and Dan found out this morning that he has passed the licensing exam for the College of Registered Psychotherapists in Ontario. So Dan is now a fully qualified uh, counsellor and therapist in Ontario, and I'm just so proud of Dan. He's, uh, he's worked extraordinarily hard to get w where he is, and uh, I just love him to bits. So congratulations, Dan. I'm so proud of you. And Dan is um, a Bluefield Bobcat. Uh, he went to Bluefield High School, and yesterday, the senior men's triple A rugby team won the provincial championship for the first time since 2006. Now, most of the team were not even born in 2006, um, and they beat the Charlottetown Rural Raiders 14 10 yesterday in what I understand was a really exciting game. So, congratulations to the, the senior men's rugby team from Bluefield who won the provincial AAA championship. And I want to make special note of Daryl Boudreau, who is the athletic director there at Bluefield High School. And Daryl won a national award recently. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the award, but I know it was given uh, to the, uh, the most outstanding high school athletic director across the country for displaying honesty and sincerity and sportsmanship in their work. And any of us in the house, I saw a couple of heads nodding when I mentioned his name there, would be very familiar with the amazing work that Daryl has done with the athletic program at Bluefield High School and how respected he is there. And obviously, he's still producing winning teams. So congratulations, Daryl, on that award and the Bob Go Bobcats. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow and Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise. Say hello to everyone in District 10, Charlottetown Winslow. Of course, welcome everyone in the gallery. And a big hello to Caitlin and Megan, um, Easter Seals Ambassadors. I have kids that go to West Royalty Elementary. And the highlight of their spring so far was when you guys came to the school. They absolutely love it. So it's, uh, it's great to be in your presence here today. Um, Madam Speaker, I also want to uh, say a very quick hello to uh, the, if you're driving on the Lower Malpac Road in uh, District 10, you'll notice that there is a flurry of activity up by the Winslow Charlottetown uh, soccer complex with the Royals. Uh, brand new manager of operations directly from Mexico City, Dire uh, Diego Orozco, who is doing a, a fantastic job, as well as uh, summer students Sophie Freeman and Jacob Tweel. I do want to say a big congratulations to a constituent of mine that is she just continues to amaze me Colleen Henderson uh, who the football community on PEI would know this lady from tip to tip uh, she has been named the new football coordinator from the men's Holland College Hurricanes team so a big congratulations out to Colleen very well deserved and also a good friend of mine also a constituent uh, Mark Carragher winning the Country View Open back-to-back -back champion draining a 30-foot putt on the weekend to win that so congratulations <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Education Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise. Uh, welcome back to all my colleagues today. Hello to everyone tuning in uh, from District 9. And a big hello to our special guests here today. As uh, others have noted, we have uh, Caitlin and Megan Rogers, our Easter Seals ambassadors. And they're also known as 
double trouble, Madam Speaker. <laughs> oh my gosh, and they lived up to that name too. Um, and their parents, Kevin and Andrea, what wonderful supports you folks are. And hello to Kelly Malali as well, the Executive uh, Director of Easter Seals. Uh, Madam Speaker, I am going to be giving a minister's statement uh, later on regarding the girls, but I did uh, want to rise and welcome them and just uh, really congratulate them. They had a, uh, a record year in terms of fundraising. Uh, and it, uh, it really was unbelievable. There wasn't a dry eye in the crowd when uh, I joined them on their final part of the tour at Elliott River, their home school. So, Madam Speaker, again, welcome to these uh, two amazing, amazing, amazing young ladies. And uh, I hope everyone has a great session today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to rise today and to welcome Kaylin and Megan. Or, as some may know, as hip and hop. <laughs> so I just wanted to share a little bit of a story about Megan and Caitlin, and I, I will uh, allow you to uh, remember their names as I did. Um, Caitlin has curly hair, and the K could stand for curls, and Megan has straight hair. So for um, the time that I was at Elliott River and I got to work with the girls, uh, that was how I could remember their name. Caitlin for curls and Megan for straight. And the other thing I wanted to share with you about the girls today is their love of music and dance. And that I share with them. And a couple of our favorite songs would be Smooth Like Butter, Fancy Like, and if you ever get the opportunity to, to listen to these two little girls sing to you Taylor Swift's song, The Love Story, or I think it might just be Love Story, um, it will, it's a crowd pleaser. So welcome. It's so exciting to see you here today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Minister, Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today, and I actually I want to claim Caitlin and Megan as my own, as they're from Cornwall. So everybody can talk about them, but they live uh, they live in Jake Drive in Cornwall. So a lot of winners. Um, also, I'd like to recognize Kevin and Andrew who've done a great job. Some connections there. Kevin works in the, in the department at the university that my mother used to work in. Uh, we found that out uh, in, in talking with Kevin. Also, a little shout out to Shane Dunn, who is actually the nephew of the former health minister, Robert Mitchell, who was a vice, pre uh, vice principal at Elliott River, who did a fantastic job in the lead up to the announcement of the... Uh, of the, of the fundraising total, so I won't take away from the Minister of Education, but he did a fantastic job in building up um, the crowd, and it was emotional, I'll tell you that. It, it was it was a highlight of, of, of the last few months for me, for sure. So congratulations to these two um, great young people who represented Easter Seal so well for us. Thank you, guys. Council member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues, and hello to everyone tuning in from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, and around the island. A special welcome to everyone in our gallery today, and of course, a special welcome to, Ka to Caitlin and Megan. Uh, the first time I think that I, I met Caitlin and Megan in person was when we, we both had the opportunity to present medals at Brookvale to skiers during the Canada Games. So that was that was a really fun event. So I look forward to the member statement later on today and thank you for being with us here today. And Madam Speaker, I don't know what happened yesterday. Greetings went by so quickly, I missed my opportunity. June 6th is a huge day for birthdays in my life. And so I just had to take a minute to wish a happy belated birthday now to my mother-in-law, Carol Mann, to my cousin that's more like a sister, Jenny Mosier, to my daughter's stepmom, Yolande Murphy, and to my good friend, Tara Perry from Summerside. So happy birthday to, to all of you. And I would also like to give a shout out to all of our island students who we know that our young people are way more progressive than any generation that has preceded them. And you continue to shine in the face of such adversity coming from, from some of the adults in your lives. So thank you, Madam Speaker, and I hope everyone enjoys the day. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise here in uh, this legislature. Certainly want to say hello to all those who may be watching in from beautiful District 26, Albert and Bloomfield. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, you know, when I can't get out to uh, actually with the legislature uh, in session, uh, to have a chat with some of the farmers in uh, my district, I attempt to give them a call and uh, over the last couple of nights have spoke with some of the potato farmers up in the West Prince area. 
they were great to see, it was great to see the rain, cropping was coming along great, but they're looking forward to getting back on the land, certainly. Uh, and Madam Speaker, I also want to recognize those who were with us in the gallery today. Uh, again, uh, as it's been uh, done by so many this afternoon, a special shout out to Caitlin and Megan, great to have you here with us. And Madam Speaker, as uh, some of you may know, 2023 is the 150th anniversary of the RCMP serving us in law enforcement in this great country of ours. And I will be doing a ministerial statement on it later uh, this afternoon. We want to welcome those in the gallery from the RCMP. And if you'll indulge me just for another few seconds, uh, Madam Speaker, as well, uh, there's uh, two connections to some of our members here in the legislature who serve in the RCMP. We have Tyler Deagle, who is the brother of the Honorable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport, and Culture, as well, Andrew Dillon, who is the son of the Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. So to both Tyler, Andrew, all our CMP officers in this great country, coast to coast to coast, thank you for your service. The Honourable Member from uh, Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it is a pleasure to rise today and welcome all of my colleagues back and to all of our special guests uh, joining us today in the gallery. And to those tuning in uh, in beautiful District 5, Mermaid Stratford, uh, a big hello to you as well. Madam Speaker, I'd like to send out congratulations to the Charlotte Emeralds AAA Girls Rugby Team. Uh, yesterday I'm winning the silver medal. And to, I have a special little connection to that team. My niece, Maria Redmond, plays on that team. And this is her last uh, opportunity as a senior high school student, and she represented her school well. So congratulations to all those that played. Thank you. To arise, and of course, welcome everyone watching from District 18 Rest of Emerald and our distinguished guests here in the gallery. Of course, uh, um, Caitlin and Megan, our, our Easter Seals ambassadors, that's great, as well as our RCMP officers. Great to see you here. We need more of you on the island. You heard me pushing a you know photo radar. I hope that's not offensive. <laughs> you guys are in support, but uh, a matter of speaker. <laughs> Madam <laughs> Speaker, I also wanted to wish uh, my daughter Annika Trivers uh, congratulations. She was part of the bronze medal winning uh, rugby sevens team with, with Bluefield. And um, I also wanted to give a shout out to the Sterling Women's Institute. On Sunday I was able to attend just a wonderful luncheon and presentation. They celebrated 110 years, Madam Speaker, and it was emceed by Joan Sinclair, their Vice President, and Phyllis Carr, their President. And they recognized Mayor Marion Reed with a special presentation, as well as uh, three members, Anita Gallant with 70 years, Helen McEwen 75 years, and Olga Wollner with 70 years. Uh, Miriam Lank, the uh, 75 years, yes, amazing. And uh, Miriam Lank was there, who's the president of, the, of the, the Island Women's Institute. And she talked about Florence Matheson, who was the Canadian Women's Institute president from 1964 to 67, and just and did a great presentation. And, and Marilyn Simpson and I may have really uh, snuck in all the gluten-free treats we possibly could that were presented there. It was, it was just fantastic. And, and Madam Speaker, uh, with your job, just on Saturday, uh, I was able to attend Anne Gilbert as well uh, with the Minister of Education early years. We were there and it was, uh, it was just a wonderful musical. It reminds me uh, about how much uh, the legacy of Lucy Maud Montgomery adds to our island. And Wade Lynch said it best when he said the themes are really about the future and what we think of as being old, something written 100 or 110 years ago is something that has fresh meaning today that we can learn from. So thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of uh, Social Development Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise today and to recognize everybody in the gallery, uh, Blake and Gerard and uh, RCMP officers and uh, you other folks. I'm sorry I don't know your names, but I certainly know two sweet girls down there. Um, and I would like to make a special welcome to Caitlin and Megan Rogers, PEI's Easter Seals Ambassadors, to the gallery. A special welcome to their parents, Andrea and Kevin. And I have a little story to tell. Um, their Aunt Mindy is going to marry my nephew Alex this summer, and I'm going to perform the wedding. Am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> I have, oh my 
my goodness. Well, I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, the wrong, wrong. Oh my goodness, I, I apologize for that. I had the, well, that wedding is going to happen. <laughs> And I am performing the wedding and the girls are invited. How's that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so my story, I thought I was closer than, than the Minister of Health here, but I'm not after all. Good try. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your work as ambassadors this year and for joining us today. I would also like to help spread the word on a fundraising event in support of Easter Seals PEI in partnership with the Rotary Club of Montague and Eastern PEI tre uh, Treasures in the Trunk, happening this Saturday in the parking lot at the <laughs> of the Cavendish <laughs> Wellness Center in Montague from 8 to 1 p.m. This is funny. This will be an opportunity to sell <laughs> and buy new and used antique items, clothing, plants, baked goods, tools, and other surplus items from the trunk of your vehicle. All proceeds from this vendor, entry fees, 50-50 ticket sales, and fundraising barbecue will be donated to the Easter Seals PEI to support their mission to improve the lives of Islanders living with disabilities. Thank you, girls, for coming today. And thank you, Madam Speaker. And forgive me. <laughs> Statements by members, beginning with the member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last week, a two-page two hate flyer on the topic of sexual education and parents' rights was distributed throughout Island's communities to parents, students, and residents. It calls out policies, guidelines that support gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. It is filled with misinformation, outrageous comments, and suggests that Islander educators were not up to the task of conducting age-appropriate sexual education. Calling it, a, calling it a Canadian Day of Action, this intolerance <laughs> prejudice and discriminatory group of people call on parents to keep their kids home from school this Friday to protest against gender ideology and sexualization of children in public schools. Yesterday, I stood in this house and called on this government and the Minister of Education who represents our educators in this province to stand up and first denounce and condemn this brochure and second state this, this government's full and unwavering support for the transgender community and our transgender students, parents, and educators. I gave the minister to stand up and unite with the community. Madam Speaker, the response was less than adequate and sure does not sit well with those in the community who were targeted by this repulsive brochure. I ask this question to give government the opportunity to make it crystal clear what they think this type of language being sent out to Islanders, a brochure that is literally trying to push their discriminatory views on Islanders. Tensions are growing, and I remain committed to standing up for marginalized communities. Monday, when the media asked the government for a response, they declined. Government sent out a statement, but I can't find it, and it's nowhere to be found. Madam Speaker, silence in the face of hate is not the right decision. This government has a duty to stand up in person in this House to reassure our Islanders that you support our transgender communities and our island students for families who have been unfairly targeted and condemned with this brochure here and now, express unwavering support for the transgender community and our transgender students. In my com conversation with members of the transgender community, they have one ask. They want a reassurance that this government, that this act of hate would not take us backwards, that we would not find ourselves in a situation like we have witnessed in New Brunswick, that the Department of Education will stay the course with existing programs and policies and respecting the support of gender identity, gender expression and sexual orientation in our school. I stand united to bring marginalized people from the outside to the center. Do you? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I want to take some time to remind government and the Minister of Health that, despite what they say and despite what they want Islanders to believe, the provincial government is in fact responsible for the administration and the delivery of health care services in this province. We have learned, or we have heard this government time and time again rise in this very house and state that health care delivery is the responsibility of health PEI. We have heard the Minister and the Premier minimize the concerns of Islanders, patients, families, communities and health care staff by stating that the crisis in health care is a nationwide problem, something every jurisdiction is struggling with. Now they do this as to escape responsibility for their own inaction their poor decision making, their inability to communicate with stakeholders and their do-nothing approach to solving the challenges our system is facing. 
because if PEI is simply one piece of a much bigger problem, how can anyone hold this government responsible for the erosion of the services that we are seeing? But the truth is, not every province in this country is in as bad a shape as we are in when it comes to health care. Rural communities like, the northern, like northern Ontario, uh, the BC interior, and the Yukon are finding ways to maintain services. Yet here in PEI, we are reducing services at every turn. We have doctors leaving our province in droves, and we have a government who is refusing to take responsibility and refuses to actually put forward viable solutions. Instead, we have a minister whose seemingly favorite excuse is that he likes to leave decisions to health care to others. Well, Minister, it's time that you do what, we, what you were appointed to do, acknowledge that things have gone from bad to worse on your watch, acknowledge that frontline staff are burning out on your watch, acknowledge that doctors and other practitioners are leaving the province in record numbers on your watch, and acknowledge that communication with workers, patients, and residents has gotten considerably worse on your watch. Madam Speaker, Islanders deserve more than this reactionary wait-and-see approach from this government. The reality is, Islanders pay a lot of money in taxes for health care, hundreds of millions of dollars. Islanders are paying more and getting less from this government and this minister. That needs to change. Madam Speaker, I would like to ask the minister to finally do what he was appointed to do, take responsibility for health care in this province and come up with some creative, forward-thinking solutions. Stop hiding behind others and lead on the health file. Islanders are begging you to put them first for a change. Stop making excuses. Stop the miscommunication. Stop hiding behind others. Act now and ensure every Islander has adequate access to health care from tip to tip. Islanders are watching. Thank you. Member from Rustic Emerald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, most of Prince Edward Island's tourism operations are open and off to the start of what may well be a record season, another record season. Uh, this includes restaurants, golf courses, deep sea fishing charters, theaters, music venues, campgrounds, hotels, motels, inns, short term rentals, experiential tours, amusement parks, our famous Anne of Green Gables attractions, and much more. Madam Speaker, tourism operators have worked together for many decades to build the Prince Edward Island brand that is world famous. Indeed, every successful tourism season begins years in advance. To support our tourism sector is critically important that our provincial government plan well in advance and cooperate closely with our tourism businesses. For example, next year is the 150th anniversary of author, author Lucy Maud Montgomery's birth, an islander that has played a tremendous role in documenting and defining island culture and bringing it to the rest of the world. I look forward to hearing how government will support tourism operators in engaging this opportunity to bring thousands of Lucy Maud Montgomery enthusiasts to our island. Anne of Green Gables is a flagship tourist attraction. But to the disappointment of many, the Anna Green Gables musical will only be performed on the main stage at the Confed Center every second year. However, I'm hopeful that it will be performed at other venues on PEI with the help and encouragement of the Department of Tourism. Madam Speaker, the SOMO Festival is another example of how our tourism operators are continuously expanding what the island offers. And it promises to be a terrific addition. But more advanced planning was needed to allow the entire tourism community to prepare complement the product and mitigate negative impacts. Anything the Department of Tourism can do to help coordinate future initiatives would be most welcome. Madam Speaker, when I speak with visitors to PEI, it is clear that islanders who work in our tourism industry are what makes it truly world class. Our tourism operators bring hundreds of millions of dollars into our island economy, provide thousands of jobs, and collect millions of dollars in sales tax for government coffers. Tourism operators deserve government attention and support to ensure that our tourism industry continues to thrive into the future. Madam Speaker, I salute those who work in our tourism industry, wish them luck in the upcoming summer season, and thank them for everything they contribute to Prince Edward Island. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, I spoke with a health care worker just this morning. They informed me that the summer schedule has been, de has been determined for the Kings County Memorial Hospital. And it turns out that the ER will be closed every weekend from July the 1st until the end of September, smack dab in the middle of tourist season when our island population balloons. Question to the Minister of Health. Why is it that Islanders are finding out this information from me here during question period? Mm. Why has your government once again failed to openly communicate the real situation of island health care to Islanders instead of relying on our opposition members to give them the honest truth? Oh, 
General Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, we continue to work uh, on staffing the, the KCMH Emergency Department. Um, obviously, uh, we're looking for locum support uh, at that facility. So. Um, they continue to work on, on staffing it appropriately, and, and again, uh, they'll work till as long as they can to try to, to uh, recruit either full-time staff or locum staff to that facility. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So the Minister doesn't even acknowledge that it's closed. Maybe he doesn't even know. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Madam Speaker, the Kings County Memorial Hospital Emergency Department sees an average of 50 people, that's 50 island patients per day on the weekend, totaling 100 patients. Uh, patients on the weekend. We've heard the CEO of Health PEI say that closures at the uh, KCMH will result in increased traffic in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital emergency oh, rooms. So how can the QEH handle another increase in traffic when we heard reported just yesterday that 245 acute care beds at the QEH were all occupied, leaving 15 ER patients admitted to the hospital with nowhere to go? Question to the Minister of Health. As you have already settled on the schedule for Kings County Memorial Hospital, can you tell Islanders today what your plans are or what plans government has in place to alleviate the pressures that will obviously build up at the QEH during this period? Mm. Well, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, we, we are continuing to work um, uh, on, on staffing that facility. We understand the pressures that it does place in other parts of our system. Uh, we do appreciate uh, all the support that we get from those health care workers in order to, to try to manage the, the patient flow that they have. We know it's significant and we, you know, we are working as hard as we can to try to support those workers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. There's still no acknowledgement of the closure. So, Madam Speaker, this minister talks a lot about relying on the professionals of health PI to make decisions about health care operations in our province. And I'm assuming the minister was notified in advance of this planned closure that will see ER services as, at Kings County got it during the busiest time of the year. Question to the minister. When did you and your department sign off on this plan to close Kings County ER? General Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, as I said before, we're, we're continuing to try to staff this unit. Obviously, um, it is hard to run a health system from day to day, so we are looking forward to what contingency plans we might have to put in place at that facility, but we're continuing to work at it. Uh, my belief is that Health PEI has released some information about the possibility that it will close, and as we move closer to that date, they will announce the, the plans for the summer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. This government has a habit of hiding behind civil servants when it's uh, of political convenience. This minister wants Islanders to believe that he has no advanced information on healthcare <coughs> decisions and that these decisions are entirely out of his hands. Question to the Minister of Health. Are you, in fact, the Minister of Health responsible for health services in PEI, or should I direct my questions elsewhere? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, no, I, I certainly would take all your questions and answer those. Uh, again, uh, as Minister of Health, I, I don't schedule ORs or, or anything like that. It's a little bit out of my expertise, but we do work closely with Health PEI and, and manage uh, our facilities to the best of our ability. So, yes, keep uh, asking the questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Opposition, Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I'm not sure if he finally confirmed that he is in fact a minister responsible for health care delivery in our province, but Minister, as you know, you were appointed to Cabinet. It comes with a responsibility and an expectation to act and be accountable for your department, which includes health PEI. It's not just about the feather in your hat being in the Cabinet. Question to the Minister, when did you inform your Cabinet and caucus colleagues from Kings County of this closure, particularly the member from Suri Elmira, the Minister of Environment uh, from Georgetown, the Minister of Fisheries from Monaco, whose district is a home to the hospital. And what did you tell them to say to their constituents who will definitely be impacted by this closure? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my message to, to our members uh, from those districts would be the same as, as in this House. It would be consistent that we continue to try to work. We understand the challenges there. Um, we're, we're doing the best we can under the situation that we have. It's unfortunate. Um, we are trying to, to staff that system. And we understand, um, again, those members are, are probably the best advocates to, to maintain those services in Kings County. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So there still is no acknowledgement of this uh, closure. So, Madam Speaker, we have said time and time again that communication is of critical importance in our health care system. It is quite clear that not only is this minister 
not being open with Islanders about his decisions and how they are impacting our healthcare system, and it seems like he is not even briefing his own colleagues. So question to the Minister, do you believe it's critical to be open in your approach to communication with all stakeholders in your healthcare system, including residents, patients and healthcare workers? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I absolutely agree that I should, we should be open with uh, our, our constituents and Islanders about our situation that we, that we are in. I don't think we have uh, tried to hide any issues and stuff like that. We always try to communicate the situation that we're under and, and the rationale behind these decisions. Um, again, uh, they're operational decisions. They're not political. Um, we are simply trying to staff each facility in a safe way and respect our current health providers that, so that they can work efficiently and that we don't burn them out and we lose any more. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, this will shut down, or this shutdown of the Kings County Memorial Hospital Emergency Department could have been avoided if only this minister could wrap his head around the concept of open communication with health workers. It's my understanding that Dr. Christensen was in negotiations, in negotiations with government to take shifts that would allow for this ER to remain open all summer. After a breakdown in communications, he resigned out of frustration. Now we have one less doctor in a rural PI and another 1,300 islanders without a doctor. And we have an ER that is going to be closed on weekends during the busiest season of the year. Question to the minister. Instead of simply standing up and saying once again that communication is a key, can you please start practicing what you preach and finally start communicating and negotiating with our healthcare stakeholders, uh, stakeholders openly and in good faith? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I agree. It is unfortunate that we uh, don't have a physician practicing in Montague that continues to live there. I, I, I would recognize that. Um, again, Health PEI, I think, um, as we worked with a physician in the past, and we'll continue to work with that physician to see if, if we can get that physician back in our system. Uh, we value every single physician that we have, all 388 of them I think we have on Prince Edward Island. We value every single one. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So my final question to the uh, Minister of Health. Instead of standing up day after day and refusing to answer questions, will you simply stand up in the House and take responsibility for the state of health care and the miscommunications between your department, health PEI, staff and islanders trying to access health services in our province? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I disagree with the premise that, that we're not communicating and, and that there's not coordination. Again, uh, I think we've seen it in, in Albert the other night. We have a, a lot of staff that are working really hard around the clock to try to manage our system as best we can. Um, it's what they do. Um, and again, is it challenging? Absolutely it is, yes. Uh, and if you talk about my watch, it has been about eight weeks. And I can assure you that um, hopefully the next eight weeks uh, will be a little better than my first eight weeks. Thank you, Madam Speaker. West Thank you, Madam Speaker. Hospice PEI is a volunteer-driven organization that plays a critical role assisting Islanders by preparing, supporting, and caring for those affected by life-limiting illnesses before and after death. In 2022, Hospice PEI helped and supported more than 500 Island families and more than 250 specialized trained volunteers dedicated to over 15,000 hours providing support uh, in the Provincial Palliative Care Centre, in long-term care homes, acute care settings, and in Islanders' homes. The organization requested a meeting with the Premier, but didn't get one. They have requested a meeting with the former Minister of Health uh, and the current Minister of Health. These meeting requests were also unanswered. Question to the Minister of Health. Hospice PI deserves to feel valued and respected by your government. Will you commit today to responding to, to this vital organization and setting up a meeting? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, yes, uh, they have uh, reached out to our office. Um, unfortunately, I, I did not know how long I was going to be out with my own health issue. Um, so we did delay on, on scheduling some meetings, but we're back on track now. And uh, I can assure you that my calendar is fill, filling up very quickly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you for that. In January of this year, Hospice BI submitted a funding request to government. And sadly, it is no surprise that this organization has yet to receive a response from the former minister and the current minister or the premier as to whether or not their application is being reviewed and how the approval process even works. Let me remind this government, Hospice PEI helps Islanders with medically provided palliative care diagnosis, experience 
person-centered care through their dying journey, and yet this organization relies entirely on fundraising and donations to, the, to this important work. Question to the Minister. Will you commit to providing predictable core annual funding to hospice PEI as requested? so they can focus more on caring for islanders and less mm -hmm. on securing donations to provide this vital service. Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and, and again, they do do fantastic work. It has touched my family as well. And I'm sure it's touched a lot of families uh, in, this, in this legislature and the work that they do. Um, I believe from a budget request uh, perspective that may have went to finance. Again, I've only been in the position for eight weeks, so again, um, the, the that they have they reached out about uh, funding opportunities and that we need to look at them seriously. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Member from Charlotte, Madam Member Royalty. I'm, I'm just confused because the budget went out. I figured that we'd be able to be easily answering that question. So did they get approval? Because they have submitted it in January. Is that approval? And maybe I should ask the Minister of Finance, is, palliative, is, is, is this important group's funding, has it been approved by this government? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, that's something I can look into and bring back to the House. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you. Uh, this morning, my colleagues and I met with the Canadian Cancer Society, a charity organization that also advocates for those diagnosed and living with cancer. A recent 2022 poll conducted by the Canadian Cancer Society found that 75% of Atlantic Canadians would prefer to die at home. But we know that in 2019 and 20, 642 islanders that used palliative care at the end of, at the end of their lives, 81 died at home. That's only 12.6%. The current system is not structured to accommodate palliative care at home. Uh, there, there is not enough staff for this type of care at home, forcing loved ones to be in caregivers even at the end of their life stage when they simply want a husband, wife, son, or daughter for their dying relatives. They want the burden of the caregiving to be passed on so they can simply be there as a loved one. Question to the Minister of Health. What are you doing to improve our palliative care system to allow islanders to die with dignity at home, surrounded by family that is free to support them in their dying days, unburdened by the duties of caregiving? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do thank the member for, for bringing up this important topic. It is, is very, very important that we support, especially with our aging population. And, and again, um, I know it's touched myself and, and, and other people in, in, in the House. So I think it's important that we look at those issues. And I, I'll commit to working with the member to, to provide the supports and, and to put those uh, mechanisms in place to support uh, hospice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Gentleman member from Charlottetown, West Road. I appreciate that. These are, these are good questions that have been brought to us by organizations. So um, I, I look forward to working with the minister very diligently on this. Today our hospitals are at capacity. There has been substantial jump in the amount of people awaiting long-term care from 2020 to 2022. People sitting in beds in hospitals, needing services but receiving none. They are not in long-term care and they are not in palliative care and they are not going home. There are staff shortages in long-term care, staff shortages in palliative care, and people are unable to go home in their dying days. We are not doing enough for the people in need. Question to the Minister of Health. Palliative care needs to be looked at holistically across the system. What financial investments is government proactively making in terms of palliative care and end-of-life care to ensure the services are universally accessible by all islanders? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I appreciate the question. Um, there is a move, obviously, in health for community care support, such as the caregiver grant, uh, the, the uh, life, life alert system. So we are moving to help support those who wish to stay at home longer. Um, and again, if, if that includes uh, end of life care, uh, it's something that's very important that we need to work on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Got a member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank, thank you, Minister. And, and uh, this morning, a constituent uh, brought to my attention and uh, received this notification from his family doctor, and it says, quote, effective June 1st, 2023, I have reduced my practice to part-time. Regrettably, this will result in longer wait times. This change is necessary because of the new pressures on the health care system and the resulting lack of resources necessary to advance patient care. We are fully booked for June. This is from a doctor. Question to the minister. What does this mean? New pressures on the health care system and the resulting lack of resources necessary to advance patient care. 
Yeah, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. Uh, as you'll see in, in the budget debate uh, that will happen in the next few days, that we are going to provide more supports uh, to our physicians in their clinics and, and their practices. It's important so that they can uh, support as many clients as they can uh, and as efficiently as they can. So you will see some supports in, in that budget that we put forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Bill member from Charlottetown West Royalty. No, I'm really, con I'm really concerned about the doctor's statement because again, he says lack of resources necessary to advance patient care. If they were in there, we, we needed to get to them before the doctor reduced his hours to part time because that is the excuse that he used. We're, we're too late. Why is your department, question to the minister, why is your department not uncertain that they have the resources before now, before the budget came out, to care for their patients? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, again, I guess we, I agree with, uh, I mean, I have been in the position eight weeks. We've, this, uh, the first budget that we formed, we'll continue to work on it. We are in a transformational time in health care. We understand that we need to support our, our physicians as best we can. I think, again, back to a 15% increase in the budget. Obviously, we're putting the money behind that, but we have to execute on that, and we will, I can assure you that there will be a sense of urgency in executing and supporting our physicians as best we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I don't know how I'm going to tell my constituent all that. <laughs> Um, we, are, we are happy this family physician is not leaving completely and is opting to reduce his hours. But because this family doctor will be reducing their practice to part-time, their patient will not be eligible to be placed on the patient registry and will not have access to Maple for free services. Uh, what do you suggest these patients and my constituent if they need immediate service? Should, should um, this family doctor patient go to the QEHER? Is that, is that their only option at this time? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, we are working on uh, certain initiatives. Maple would be one of them as we're going to expand the coverage for Maple uh, this year. Again, you'll see that in the budget. So again, it's not a replacement to actual in-person care, but it is another option uh, for Islanders. Again, back to doctors, um, we, we have that challenge in any health care uh, situation where they're trying to balance work life. And then, and then, and again, we are in a different time where uh, the doctors of the past used to work crazy hours and didn't have much of a life, and we respect that. So again, um, we will work with any physician to try to maintain their work-life balance for them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. And I guess I've heard this story before, where a patient goes to a facility and they see that their doctor's not there or it spreads around. But I'm worried about you, Minister, not having that information beforehand. How many other doctors do we have on Prince Edward Island right now that are looking to st stop their practice or reduce their hours currently, Minister? Madam Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of refer to the Peachy Report, and again, which was uh, a pretty deep dive into to our physicians and so on and so forth. So you'll see in that report that we have about 388 physicians, but back to the way they practice and their percentages, it is around the equivalent of 300 doctors, and that, that is okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but again, uh, well, there is money in this budget to open up the master agreement in order to incentivize and to maybe do what we've done with the nurses to try to incentive more full-time work and to compensate them fairly for that work. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. Can you confirm that the summer schedule for the Kings County Memorial Hospital ER has been released to staff? Mm. Madam Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, I don't want to defer the question, but that's not something that the Minister of Health w would do. It would be in conjunction with the staff, uh, th with Health PEI. I know that that's not the answer that they want, but again, they are the operational to staff that uh, ER to the, the very final hour. So that's what the current staff is working on. The Atlantic Registry continues to have more people sign up for that. So again, we don't have access, unfortunately, to those list of doctors that have put their hand up, but uh, they are, uh, it is an option, opportunity for us to fill those positions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry for that. Okay. No. Honorable Leader of the no. Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A constituent of mine reached out a few days ago to share with me her very personal story of undergoing fertility treatment and the challenges and frustrations that she's encountered trying to access financial help through the government's fertility treatment program. She began treatment a few months ago and was told to keep her medical receipts for reimbursement, but she recently found out 
that the province now only covers costs incurred after you submit your application for approval. A question to the Minister of Health. Why do we no longer cover medical costs incurred prior to approval of, uh, of an individual's application? The Honourable Minister of Health Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I guess I, that doesn't seem right to me, to be quite honest with you. Uh, so I would encourage you to maybe we'll have a sidebar and talk about that situation and see if we can get some uh, move on that file and, and help that person out if possible. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I appreciate the response, Minister. And uh, this individual was very clear that uh, her circumstances, uh, they can cope with it fa as a family financially, but she's more concerned about other islanders who may be caught up with this policy change. Because undergoing fertility treatment is costly, it's stressful, and uh, it's a deeply emotional process. And remembering to fill out an application form prior to incurring any medical costs could understandably slip somebody's mind. A question to the same minister. It used to be that all medical costs incurred through treatment were eligible for reimbursement, and now you have to go through this pre-approval process, and any medical costs incurred prior to getting approval are no longer elig eligible. You've just said that you would like to look into this, and I'm assuming the answer, the answer to this question, is this really a patient-centred approach that you would support, would be no. Is that correct, minister? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. I, I do agree with the Honourable Member on the premise of the question. It's something we need to look at. Obviously, uh, not everybody be aware of all the programs that we have in health. It's, it's a challenge to communicate with the public on all the things that we do do. Um, uh, and that would be one of those programs that we need to look at and look at eligibility and make it easy for people to access care uh, when they need it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you. I feel I haven't got a firm commitment from you yet, Minister, so I'm going to ask my final question. Will you firmly commit to removing the new policy and allowing approved families to be reimbursed for costs incurred throughout their treatment as long as it occurred after the program began in 2021? I understand that, of course. And that they retain and submit all of their receipts related to treatment. Health and uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish I had the data in front of me about the supports that we have provided, and I will provide it to the member uh, on uh, uh, after today. I will grab that information because I know we are doing lots of supports uh, for fertility treatments. But I do agree with the premise, and I will work with the department. I will commit to try to make that happen. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yesterday, in consideration of the estimates, I spoke about the students I had spoken to who had shared with me they had questions around why we need police officers in schools. Students and families have told me that it makes them feel less safe in their school. There were no asks for this in pre-budget submissions. I also reached out to the child and youth advocate and learned his office was not consulted in this initiative. I will remind this House there was a private member's motion passed after the budget was tabled. If children aren't asking for police in schools, can the Minister of Education explain where this ask is coming from? The Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. We have had some success with the school resource officers within several schools across uh, the island, Madam Speaker. I do think we need to do some more due diligence in terms of how this program is going to evolve moving forward. I was pleased to see this House pass the motion around um, the school resource officers, but I agree that we do uh, certainly need to do some further consultation, and absolutely we'll be reaching out to the Child and Youth Advocate Office um, as well as ensure that youth are involved in this decision. Again, thank you for the question. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I really appreciate this because when we've got a program that's been in place since 2010 and never been evaluated, and we have other jurisdictions who are terminating the program, we can't just think that we're different. We need to look into that. The school resource officer program at Colonel Gray was cancelled in late 2022 because the city of Charlottetown simply did not have the staff to maintain the program. There, was a there is a widespread shortage of police officers that's making it harder for police agencies to operate in communities and deal with things like dangerous driving and rural PEI. To the Minister of Public Safety, do you think it's better for public safety to take police off the streets and put them in schools? The Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And, uh, it's a great question and uh, it's one that I've thought about a, a lot. And, uh, there, through, and there's going to be a, a lot of debate on this uh, going forward. And uh, I, 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 I'm 
I think the resources are better outside the school, but I do understand the, the, uh, the stress and the anxiety that is in the schools and the, and the safety. So it's a balance that we have to work with, and I hope to continue to work with the Department of Education and all members in this legislature on coming up with a proposal in the near future. Thank you. Second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The government is budgeting $750,000 to put more police in schools, despite its own admission yesterday that it has never evaluated the program and has no clue about its effectiveness. Teachers and students are not telling us they need more police. They're telling me we need more mental health and social supports for students. Why does the Minister of Education feel this money is better spent on police and schools on a program that has never been evaluated than on expanded mental health and social supports for students? The Young Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I know the Honourable Member um, had indicated that she had some conversations um, with various individuals who perhaps weren't in support, but I know myself as ministers, as well as many of my colleagues, have, um, have spoken with many individuals and school staff and students who are very much in support of it. So again, um, recognizing that uh, this is still in its initial phases. We've only had a couple of schools whereby we did have these school resource officers. Um, we are going to do our due diligence and, and uh, delve into the, the matter deeper. Um, as it relates to additional supports within our schools, Madam Speaker, uh, I'm really proud of our government, our, our budget uh, within education. It's a 10% increase uh, from last year's. It's historical in nature. Uh, we were able to add additional um, counselors, Madam Speaker. We spoke on the floor about all the additional supports within our schools, our counselors, so 15 over the last two years. It's been decades since any have been added. We've got our, um, our student well-being teams. I believe there's 52 individuals on those. We've got so many different individuals within the school environment that are supporting our students. And I feel there, there is a fit for our student well-being, our student resource officers, and we're just going to make sure that we do it right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a society, we often only think of safety when it comes to our physical environment. However, our society is changing, and rapidly in many respects. Our children and our youth socialize and interact in many different formats and using a variety of technology in today's world. Madam Speaker, that passage is from Speech from the Throne, followed by a commitment to begin work on the province's first cyberbullying prevention strategy, a move that I wholeheartedly support. So a question to the Deputy Premier, Minister of Justice and Public Safety, and Attorney General. When is work expected to begin on the development of a, of a provincial cyberbullying prevention strategy? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that question, and uh, uh, I full-heartedly agree with the member and uh, on the uh, issues uh, that are facing our young people today, and I look in the, in the, don't have to look far, but in our gallery to see some young faces that uh, uh, we need to protect, and uh, I'm happy that our, our province is going to have the first ever uh, cyberbullying strategy, and uh, as soon as the budget's passed, we're going to begin work on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, we from Surrey, Elmira, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member. This is an important issue that can and has deeply impacted families and communities. It has recently impacted people very close to me. So question to the Deputy Premier, Minister of Justice and Public Safety, and Attorney General. How will this cyberbullying prevention strategy be developed, and what will the work look like? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and Honourable Member for the question, and uh, how that's going to look like. It, there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done, Madam Speaker, and it's uh, something new that uh, we're, we're, we're doing here, and it's, it's going to be cutting edge, and we have to make sure we do it right. So as soon as I'm able to table a plan, uh, after the budget's passed, I will do that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Surrey, Elmira, your second supplementary. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I look forward to seeing that uh, honourable member. Um, sadly, this issue has impacted many islanders, so their perspective will be valuable in creating a provincial cyberbullying prevention strategy. So my question to the Deputy Premier and Minister of Justice and Public Safety. How will interested islanders and members of the public have the chance to contribute to this work? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the, for the question again. And uh, I, we're going to be setting up a task force, and uh, that task force is going to reach out to all uh, people in the public that uh, for input to guarantee that we have the best policy going forward to help protect our not only our youth but all islanders uh, with the cyberbullying that happens in this everywhere, and uh, to make all islanders safe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the Government Whip. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, PEI beaches, of course, remain a popular draw for islanders and visitors, especially out to the North Shore and the National Park. Um, I actually uh, took the kids out there an evening last week, and it was funny because we went to Brackley, and the entrance to Brackley Beach is closed, and passed along Ross Lane, passed along Stanhope. Eventually, finally, after looking for parking everywhere, we finally found a spot over near Cove Head. Um, I, I do remember when I worked in the radio that there was a shuttle service in the summer months that basically got people to the beaches out of the national parks. Of course, that was long before the huge level of public transportation that we see around the province now. Question to the Minister of Transportation. Given the popularity of the national park beaches, as well as some of our local and provincial beaches like Pamir Island, Basin Head, Canoe Cove, or Thunder Cove, and the growth, of course, of public transit. Has there ever been any thought given to piloting a beach shuttle service for the summer months? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. A great question it is, uh, and certainly agree 100% with the Honourable Member. But Prince Edward Island is renowned for uh, what I would say the very best beaches in Canada. Uh, last year, uh, Madam Speaker, there was uh, uh, the pilot project of, uh, of uh, in conjunction with rural transit uh, for a uh, run from Charlottetown out to Cavendish. This will be put in place and launched again this year. Uh, starts on June 19th, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, Government Whip. Yes. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you, Minister, for the answer. And yes, that was for workers. I'm thinking specifically, you know, for uh, the daughter who's 12, who, you know, might like to go out to with her friends, and again, she doesn't have access to a vehicle. Um, I, I do think that you should, Minister, take a closer look at something like this. A beach shuttle could improve mobility. Of course, the big thing is as we move towards net zero, it'll reduce vehicle emissions and it'll connect islanders and visitors with our famous beaches. Another potential positive benefit is around people with physical limitations or mobility impairments. The National Park uh, has improved accessibility service and a beach shuttle service could help improve access for more islanders and visitors alike. Question of the same minister. Will you look further into this idea of the uh, beach shuttle pilot and including the potential to incorporate paratransit services and maybe report back to the House? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, certainly, and again, thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, great suggestion. I certainly would take it into consideration and report back, Madam Speaker. Uh, just for clarification, though, certainly uh, the rural transit, uh, the pilot, uh, the pilot with regard to uh, Charlottetown to Cavendish, which will be starting on June 19th, certainly is a major benefit for workers that will be working out there. But uh, with that, uh, Madam Speaker, it is not exclusive just to workers. Uh, the other thing, too, uh, that I'd like to point out, and I'm sure that there's another member across uh, the way here that uh, is, uh, if not aware of this, that will be very pleased to hear of it, that uh, again, starting on June 19th, that there will be a new road put in place from Charlottetown to Rustico. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And of course, yes, the rural transit is a great initiative. And I've talked to many constituents and many people from Winslow and, and areas, and they said, uh, we would love to take the transit, and especially with a million visitors here, and maybe loving to bicycle on the island, um, you know, some who actually come to PEI for that specific reason. Question to the same minister. Now, you seem to have a great working relationship with T3 and the rural transit. I've heard of many people that would use transit more often if they could have their bicycles 
with them to get to that final destination. Question to the Minister, is this something that you have considered maybe talking with uh, T3 Transit about having bicycles, uh, a bicycle holding carrying case on the front of a bus or on the back of a bus? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, to the Honourable Member, thank you so much for these questions, for these suggestions. Uh, certainly fit in with a number of initiatives that this government has undertaken, uh, Madam Speaker, with regard to active transportation, uh, the establishment of active transportation lanes and some of our highways, a number of our highways. And certainly you look at the growth in uh, uh, in uh, those who are cycling, who are biking. It is an excellent suggestion, Madam Speaker, and I certainly will follow up uh, with discussions on that. Thank you. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, the PEI ATV Federation recently issued a press release stating it would be support to see the provincial government issue a registration fee for ATVs to raise funds to develop trails in PEI. Access to the provincial trail system was an issue brought up at many of the doorsteps uh, in the recent provincial elections, especially in my riding, in O'Leary Inverness, and the Premier did make uh, commitments to the local ATV club to create more trails. Question to the Minister of Tourism. Does the Minister of Tourism believe ATVs could provide opportunities to grow PEI's tourism industry if a province-wide trail system could be established? The yeah, Minister of uh, Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I would agree that's, that's a good idea. Um, we're trying to expand to a four season uh, as a four season destination and that's a possibility um, obviously the issue is sometimes connecting the trails and um, I know that when I was in transportation they were the ATV Federation was looking to have access to paved shoulders on the on roads um, so I know that's something they're pushing for I know we have given them given them access to a number of dirt roads and I think they've just recently increased that number quite a bit um, but no, I'm definitely supportive of the idea. Gentleman from O'Leary and Burness. Thank you, Minister. Uh, actually, Minister, the biggest impediment to a provincial tra trail system linking West Prince to the rest of PEI trails through the abandoned roads is to get through Portage. Mm. Has the Tourism Department sought options to provide a trail that ATVs could link to through from West Evan to the Bay Road? The Honorable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I'm not sure what the honorable. Are you, are you looking to have them on the main highways? I'm not sure what he's what he's looking for there. But yeah, perhaps we can find find a way to uh, to make a trail for them. But we can't have them on the Confederation Trail. That's that's not an option. Um, so I think I'm supportive of the idea if we can find a way to make it work. But I'm assuming there's a lot of private property that surrounds it. Um, but if we can find Crown land or whatnot to make it happen, but. Anyways, I'm supportive of the idea. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Well, yeah, Minister, the, the real reality is, so the, there are only two ways, as the Minister of Transportation identified, Route 2 and the Confederation Trail. And uh, I think we have to try to come up with some way if you're going to have a provincial trail system to link those two uh, and get through that. It's about approximately a kilometre and a half, two kilometres, something along that line. Uh, well, uh, you as Minister of Tourism, meet with the ATV Federation and the PEI Department of Transportation and possibly the PEI Department of Environment to help implement a plan to develop a way for the ATVs to get through Portage. Yes. Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Yeah, I can do that, Madam Speaker. We can meet with Peter and, and whoever wants to meet. And if I can support them through rural development too with grants, we're more than welcome to do, open to doing that. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness, your final question. Uh, thanks very much, and I think it is important. There has to be some minister that takes the, this uh, so-called bull by the horns here and gets everybody together and works through this complicated process of portage, which is half in my riding and half of the member of Albert and uh, Bloomfield. Uh, if there was a registration fee that was going uh, towards uh, contributing to, would it be collected by the province, and then would that money be distributed back to the ATV Federation, or would it be collected by the province so that the province would provide uh, construction of these trails or to maintain these particular trails that the ATV Association has? The Honourable Minister of uh, Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So that's actually something that would fall under the Minister of Transportation, um, but I am familiar with it because we had just met with it up recently before the election. Um, but it was the former government that signed off that wouldn't allow ATVs on the Confederation Trail, ironically, and, and now here they are asking for it. So, yeah, yes. um, 
it's unfortunate the former the former tourism minister couldn't get this done, but I'm more than I am more than welcome to try and get this. Done. Question period. Uh, ministerial statements beginning with the Minister of uh, Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Madam Speaker, I'd again like to welcome and recognize two very special guests in the gallery today, Caitlin and Megan Rogers. They are the 2023 Easter Seals Ambassadors, and I had the pleasure of joining them on, on some of their school visits in April. Caitlin and Megan are in grade five at Elliott River School and enjoy extracurriculars activities that include dancing and singing and wheelchair basketball and riding their go-karts. Both girls were born with cerebral palsy and they have conquered many challenges in their young lives, including corrective spinal surgery in 2019 that involved many months of post-operative recovery and physical therapy but this certainly has not held them back. The girls visited 63 schools in just six days, where they spoke to hundreds of other students about what makes them unique. I should say thousands of other students, not hundreds, thousands of other students. J'aimerais saluer tous les écoles de Lille et les remercier pour les efforts créatifs de collecte de fonds. Il y a eu des collectes de nourriture, des ventes de pâtisserie, des tirages, des concours de coloriage et encore, encore plus. I would also like to give a shout out to all the island schools and thank them for their creative fundraising efforts for the Easter Seals campaign this year. The schools held activities such as food drives, bake sales, raffles, coloring contests, and so, so much more. Madam Speaker, during the school visits, the girls were fondly remembered to as Double Trouble, and I think they definitely lived up to that nickname. The tour ended as K at Caitlin and Megan's school, Elliott River, and what a way to finish things off. It was amazing to see the girls' friends and classmates welcome them with such pride and enthusiasm. The school mascots greeted us as we got off the bus. Staff were wearing special t-shirts. The students had made signs and banners and the choir was singing to welcome them in. Madam Speaker, the girls tour was a record-breaking success, raising over $68,000 for this time. Caitlin and Megan's motto for this year's campaign was, believe in yourself and don't give up. And I think they are amazing examples of this motto. Caitlin and Megan, je tiens à vous féliciter à nouveau et à vous remercier d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui. Caitlin and Megan, I want to say congratulations once again and thank you for being with us here today. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Merci, merci, Madam the Ministre, pour cet uh, annoncement. And uh, welcome, uh, Megan and Caitlin. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad you're here. And, and to hear what the minister just said, it's incredible. I uh, I remember before you were born, your your mother your mother and I had had a lot of conversations about about you guys and how excited we were to come. So um, she used to come to my fitness classes back in the day. So um, I have fond memories of that. And I want to just say, um, you know, Caitlin and Megan, what you did for our province um, will be remembered for a very long time. And to raise $68,000 as, as a collective, this is more than just the money. It's about awareness. It's about getting kids excited about um, seeing things in a different way and just being together with all Islanders. And uh, what you did will live on for a very long time. So thank you for being here, Madame Le Ministre. Merci beaucoup. And uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you, Caitlin and Megan, for your tireless work. 63 schools in six days, you must be tired. <laughs> and $68,000 too, that is, that is 
just so impressive, and thank you for that, too. Um, Easter Seals is such a great initiative and one of the biggest events of the year in any school that I've ever worked at, in particular, um, of course, our elementary schools, um, where, the, where the ambassadors come to visit us. And I don't think I ever had a dry eye when ambassadors would come to visit us in our schools because of the pride that I could feel glowing off of the ambassadors and also the pride I felt for them, even though I had nothing to do with, with their amazingness, but just felt that sense of pride very strongly for SEALs every year and, and by far um, I would say the most exciting event given um, you know I can remember doing penny drives I don't think do we do those anymore probably not <laughs> um, but those were really really fun it's too bad bring back the penny um, so uh, what what uh, school ambassadors and what Megan and Caitlin have, have taught and continue to teach their fellow students about adversity and strength and resilience are incredible, valuable life lessons that, that they will carry with them forever. So you are making such a huge difference in your community, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, today I'd like to welcome and recognize two special guests who have joined us in the gallery today. RCMP Chief Superintendent Derek Santosaloso, as well as RCMP Staff Sergeant S. Troy McLean, Acting Sergeant Major L Division. Uh, Derek and Troy, thank you very much for being with us here today. This year is the 150th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police serving Canadians. To mark the 150th anniversary and to give thanks for the work the RCMP does in PEI, our Highway Safety Division has created a unique RCMP commemorative plate. These commemorative plates are similar in design to PEI's current plates but feature the letters RCMP 150. The RCMP will distribute the commemorative plates to their members, civilian staff, and retired members. I am proud to have the RCMP as a strong policing partner in our province. The RCMP has 658 detachments across Canada, Madam Speaker. In PEI, they police almost 95% of our land. This includes municipal service agreements with the communities of Stratford, Cornwall, and it also includes extended service agreements with communities including Tignish, Alberton, O'Leary, Borden Carrollton, Three Rivers, and Surrey. There are also policing partnership agreements with Lennox Island First Nation, Abiquit First Nation, the Confederation Bridge, Cavendish Beach Music Festival, as well as the Rock the Boat Tyne Valley Music Festival each summer. Citizen satisfaction levels with RCM police services in PEI have been rated the best in the country. Way to go. This is proof of the dedication and commitment of the more than 200 police officers, civilian members, and public service employees of L Division. They are all working hard to ensure a safe and secure environment for residents as well as for our visitors. I look forward to continued collaboration with the RCMP. Working together, we can ensure Islanders have a high degree of confidence in the safety on our roads and throughout our province. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Mayor. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for uh, bringing this forward. The commemorative plates will be something that I'm sure um, it's, it, it may be just a, a plate in, in a sense, but it really has a lot of meaning behind it, so uh, I'm sure they would all appreciate it uh, receiving that. Um, as mentioned, uh, some of the facts here, RCMP have been serving PEI since 1932. They're responsible for Kings, Queens and Prince County through six different service centres. There's over 200 regular members, civilian members, and public services are part of the PEI's L Division, um, and they're responsible for around uh, 90,000 Islanders. Um, so I do want to welcome to uh, our gallery today, though, the Chief Superintendent, uh, Derek uh, Santos Suso, and uh, who is the island, uh, Island's Commanding Officer. 
along with Staff Sergeant uh, Troy McLean. And Troy may be very familiar with my seatmate here, as he may have escorted him out of Myron's a few times in, in the past. Uh, yeah. uh, he said he worked with you, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you took them all. Yeah. So, Madam Speaker, uh, our, our CMP um, members are born all over the world, but they're made in Regina, Saskatchewan. And um, I had the opportunity recently to visit the, um, um, I want to make sure I get it right, the RCMP Heritage Centre in Regina. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to show the history of, of the RCMP where they evolved from uh, in 1873 when they were the Northwest Mounted Police to the modern day, modern day Mountie that they are today. So if you ever had the opportunity, you're in Regina, um, I would encourage you to visit that. It's part of our history. Anywhere, anytime you talk to anybody in this world, one of our iconic symbols is uh, the RCMP, um, and we're very, very proud of them. And I also am very proud of all of those that I had the opportunity to serve with in this house, and these are past MLAs, Bush Dumville and um, Alan Roach, um, and also to our staff um, here that keep us uh, secure every day in this building. I want to thank them for their uh, contribution and to all RCMP members for their contribution and uh, continued commitment to the um, health and welfare of all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I too would like to welcome a uh, gentleman to the, the gallery today, Derek and Troy. And uh, perhaps my seatmate has also been accompanied from Myron's on the <laughs> Friday night. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if that were the case. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this, so much has been said, and I, I do want to thank you for your service. Uh, we're very lucky here in Canada in, in so many ways, and I, I think recently of the, of the the leader of the official opposition just mentioned what an iconic part of Canadian culture the RCMP are, and the investiture of King Charles III just a few weeks ago. Um, the Mounties going down Pall Mall in, in London was, uh, I, I know, having friends and family who live in Britain, that that was actually a highlight of the, of the parade for them. So, again, I, I welcome this announcement from the Minister and I thank you both for your service. Thank you, Minister. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we reached a milestone in our net zero office and in our province. Our government has installed over 5,000 free heat pumps in homes by Islanders this May. And a lot of people, Madam Speaker, said we couldn't do it. But with hard work, collaborations, and patience, we made it happen. 5,000 low to moderate income Islanders now have access to this clean, low emission, low cost energy source to heat and cool their homes. I want to thank the staff of my department and its service PEI for making this milestone possible. Uh, thank you to all our heat pump contractors who have been providing this service to Islanders, and thank you to our applicants who have been patient with us as we take this crucial first step to moving island homes away from oil. We aren't stopping here. I look forward to hitting the milestone, uh, this milestone of free insulation and free hot water heaters in the month to come as well. Our government has introduced many financial programs to help islanders reduce their emissions and energy bills. $19 million in energy efficient rebates have been given out uh, in the last year, including heat pump rebates, solar, business and community group rebates. Over 20 megawatts of solar has been installed since the launch of our solar electric rebate program in 2019. Um, we've increased our solar rebate from $10,000 to $35,000 for farmers. Our electrical, re our electrical vehicle rebate has more than doubled the amount of EVs on island roads, and government has facilitated uh, the install of 139 public EV charges throughout the province since 2019. 691 uh, e-bike rebates and 3,236 bike rebates have also been uh, processed to date. Islanders can buy in this net zero uh, funding that works for them by using our net zero navigator. Uh, they can visit princeton.island.ca forward slash net zero to learn about the options. For those who prefer to make a call and get information in per person, those options are also still available. Visit any access, lo lo or access PEI location to pick up the application forms or reach out to us as, at 1-833-734-1873. Staff can help you book an appointment to apply for a free heat pump and get information on all of our great programs. So thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader 
of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action for uh, updating us on this, this milestone. And I was one that never doubted it. For sure, as one, I would be a big uh, supporter of this program. I know many in, in my own uh, district took advantage of whether it was the rebate program or the free heat pump program, and I love that the threshold was, was raised. It really did bring a lot of those uh, middle-income islanders who I call the working poor uh, had, had uh, an opportunity to uh, take advantage of this and, and lower the cost because inflation nowadays it's just so difficult to operate a home, and these heat pumps make a huge difference on that. So, but I would like to see it extended maybe a little bit more, possibly to, to renters, depending on the rental situation, and also to um, family members who own a home but yet leave their parents to live in it. So it might have been the family, the parents' home one time, but they, they deeded it over to a child. And I know sometimes you have to have a living interest in the deed in order to access some of these, but sometimes during the process, these parents or parents or their children um, may forget about that and uh, that may be left out. So it's something if you could make those changes, it would really help. I know a few more anyway in my district, it would def definitely benefit. So I do want to thank also um, not only the department and the staff, the minister and the staff uh, for all the work they've done on this, but also to um, those at Access PEI who were the first point of entry and helped many islanders fill out the application to make this process a lot easier. So thank you very much. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, too, of course, welcome this announcement. This is a real success story here on Prince Edward Island, and we're way ahead of the country in terms of our installation of heat pumps. I mean, I, I speak to folks in other provinces, and, uh, and some of them aren't even aware that these, <laughs> these things exist. They're, just, they're not part of their culture. They're not part of the heating systems that they're installing in, in buildings. And here on PEI, I mean, you literally can't turn a corner without seeing a heat pump, uh, the, the fan on the outside, or the inverter, rather, on the outside of one of the houses. So this is a great success story. 5,000 is a lot. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to continue with the electrification of everything, and uh, this is a big part of that. Uh, the Minister talked about 130 EV charging stations, again, way ahead of the country. Uh, you know, people come here and they're astonished at the, how many and how accessible the, the EV charging stations are. Um, this is one part of the process, of course, using electricity efficiently, and, and our heat pumps are three times as efficient as a baseboard heater, so we're really making enormous strides in that regard. But it's producing clean electricity. Again, we're working on that, and we're getting there. Um, and and the, the real sort of stumbling block here is storage and, and how we turn the clean sources of electricity, whether it's solar or wind or tidal or whatever, we, we end up using and making sure that we can store that in a way that the intermittency of all of these sources becomes less of an issue than it is right now. So using it efficiently is part of this, and again, I appreciate everything that this minister has done to promote the efficient use of electricity here in Prince Edward Island and transfer people over from oil to this. It's a great announcement, and I thank you for it, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents, the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, by leaving the House, I beg leave to table the Towns of West Prince Joint Collaboration on Emergency Health Services invitation emails, which was not extended to the Premier, and my department's correspondence with this group. And I move, second by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do line the table. With Shall your indulgence, care? Madam Speaker, Shall may carry? I summarize? Okay, after I start. Shall carry. With your indulgence, may I summarize? Sir? To summarize these emails, on May 26, our department received an invitation to a town hall in Alberton. The, um, the Minister of Transportation, myself, Dr. Gardham, and the Leader of the Opposition were on the email, along with eight other committee members. Again, I state the Premier was not included in this correspondence. On May 30th, we replied to suggest another date because Dr. Michael Gardham was out of the province and suggested June 12th. Uh, on June 2nd, we received a response that that date was not sufficient, so we went ahead with the June 5th date. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. By command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Marine Science Organization Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2022. And I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Chair Carey. 
The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Madam Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Department of Fisheries and Communities Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2022, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that the said do document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. Yeah, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Madam Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Employment Development Agency Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2022, and I move second by the Honourable Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Philip Carey. The Honourable Member from Borden Concora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, by leave the House, I beg to table a formal statement dated the 7th of June today by Irving Oil related to the company's future in Atlantic Canada. And I have to wonder if this has anything to do with the forecoming carbon tax and the clean fuel regulations brought in by the federal government. And I move second by the member from West Emerald that the said document now be received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a paper, and called what, a paper called What Are the Costs of Not Acting on Climate Change? brought forward by the Ecofiscal Institute of Canada. And I move, seconded by the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Anyone else? Reports by committees, introduction of government bills, motions other than government. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This time I'll call motion number 33. Shall, shall I carry? Motion 33. The Leader of the Official Opposition moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas Prince Edward Island is facing a shortage of health care workers, particularly in rural, which is adversely affecting access to health care for many islanders. And whereas the recruitment and retention of health care workers is essential to ensure that our health care system remains strong and resilient, both during the crisis and in the years ahead. And whereas this House acknowledges the urgent need to address the shortage of health care workers in Prince Edward Island and recognizes that retention and recruitment initiatives are necessary to achieve this goal. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly calls on the government to create new recruitment initiatives for health care workers, particularly in rural areas. Therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly call on government to develop innovative recruitment campaigns that target underrepresented groups, including Indigenous peoples, newcomers, and youth. And therefore, be it further resolved, this House urges the government to work closely with health care providers, professional associations, educational institutions, and other stakeholders to ensure that recruitment initiatives are evidence-based, cost-effective, and sustainable. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. So today I rise before you to present a motion that urgently calls on government to develop innovative recruitment campaigns addressing the province's persistent shortage of healthcare professionals. This critical issue has plagued our island for far too long, leaving our healthcare system understaffed and unable to provide adequate uh, care, particularly in rural PEI. The official opposition is urging this government to work closely with healthcare professionals providers, educational institutions, and other stakeholders to ensure that recruitment initiatives are evidence-based, cost-effective, and sustainable. The first step in this planning process typically involves identifying any issues and determining the number of available vacancies. Now, I've asked for this information for two weeks in a row from Health BEI. However, I'm currently still waiting for these numbers, so I will be forced to use our numbers from 2011 and 21. However, many Islanders and I believe that we have not seen believe that we have not seen an increase in these numbers, but a decrease in open positions. As of April 2021, there are 61 vacancies in Kings County, 240 vacancies in Prince County, approximately 400 in Queens County, for a total of 700 vacancies. 
However, let's go deeper into this topic as it concerns health PEI vacancies. As of August the 30th, 2021, health PEI needed 57 uh, clinicians and assistants, 29 social workers, 15 patient workers, 19 resident residential care workers, and 181 registered nurses. The effects of understaffed medical centers are alarming. The waiting times for essential treatments and surgeries are unacceptably long, resulting in prolonged suffering and compromised health outcomes for patients. Madam Speaker, this is asking for um, recruitment um, to be um, at the top of uh, the priority list for, for this government. We have a, a huge problem with communication, and you'll see that every day. We all see that. Islanders see that every day in this house. There's a, there's a problem with communication within House PEI and uh, the department. I'm not sure. When I ask one a question, uh, it can be thrown back. Well, that's not my decision. It's House PEI, and then the next minute it's I'm responsible for House PEI. I don't know which which one it is. The questions today regarding the closures at King's uh, County Memorial Hospital. Who, who made those decisions? We're still not even clear. We're not even sure if the minister was aware of it. Did he communicate with uh, Health PEI? Did they advise him that these closures were coming up? I know back in, I think it was mid-May, the CEO of Health PEI alluded to that a possible closures for the summer, uh, or, or not even for the summer, just coming up, um, didn't say it would be every weekend for three months during the um, high peak tourist season. Uh, and these uh, closures are nothing new to Islanders uh, in the East. Um, we all know about them in the West, obviously, and I've had people from the East being very, very concerned that this is a slow erosion, erosion of services and that the same thing that happened up West mm -hmm. will happen to them. The CEC in, at Western was uh, to close for three months. It's been closed now since August of last year, Madam Speaker. So the same concern, the same worry is there uh, in the East with the Kings County Memorial Hospital and we need to have better communication with, uh, with staff and, island with, and with Islanders too. They need to be aware of what's happening in these hospitals. Um, meeting in West Prince on Monday evening, there, were, um, there was an individual, a gentleman who stood up and his daughter had applied to Health PEI um, as a nurse, to come here as a nurse. Last year, she received no response from them. No response. Where is she? She's in British Columbia right now working. She could have been here. She could have been here on Prince Edward Island, but no, there was absolutely no response. I mentioned it in this house several times about the PEI School of Nursing. Yeah. And I'll speak in particular to West Prince. 11 graduates of West Style four years ago um, enrolled in the nursing program here at UPEI. They graduated recently. Health PEI did not meet with them to make them an offer until about a month to two months prior to graduation when every other jurisdiction met with them last fall and even some in third year. So there's, there's a problem right there, Madam Speaker. If, if, if this government was serious about recruiting, they would be communicating with those students from, from day one. They should be there at the very least the start of their third and fourth year to make them an offer and give them some kind of incentive right. to stay here. So other jurisdictions are offering them uh, lots of money, they're giving them uh, travel um, expenses being paid, rent subsidies, uh, signing bonuses, and they're making it very appealing for a young student who comes out of uh, university post-secondary with some debt. Um, they want to pay it off. They may not have anything really holding them here, so they're, they're going to go. They're going to go at the opportunity to pay off that debt that they've uh, occurred over the years. The government needs to step up to the plate, take responsibility, acknowledge that they have mishandled um, these particular individuals, um, the graduates of the PI uh, School of Nursing this year, and make sure that it never happens again. Never happens again. I had, I've had students come to me and they were like, we want to stay here. We, we, we want to stay here, but they're not making us an offer. 
And Madam Speaker, that's concerning to to these uh, to these students who uh, who really want to give back uh, to the island and want to serve on the island. They want to stay with their family and friends, but they have to make a decision. And if waiting at the eleventh hour to go in and say, "Okay, this is what we're going to offer you," um, that's a, that's a huge concern and a huge worry, not only for them but all, also for what does that say about the recruitment process? Um, right across Prince Edward Island, Madam Speaker. And that's just an example. And that is all 100% factual. Um, I've had a nurse reach out to me recently who moved here from Ontario. Um, she came just before COVID. She had to do the, um, the, the bridging program, so which would allow her then to be licensed to practice here on Prince Edward Island. She was an RN. Uh, so she did that, COVID hit. Um, she now does not qualify for any of the incentive programs um, that Health PEI is offering. She can't apply, obviously, for the graduate one, and she can't apply for the, um, the new nurses on it because she's, not, she's now a resident of Prince Edward Island. So there needs to be done. So she's reached out. She's asked him, is, you know, I'm here. I'm new to the system. You're offering these incentives for nurses to come from Dubai. You're having traveling nurses that are coming here right that here. you're paying up to $100 an hour for. I'm here. I'm right here. I'm willing to work tomorrow, starting tomorrow. Just help me out. Give me some kind of an, an initiative to show that, that I, I guess that they're, they're meaningful. But instead, they, they do not try to work with individuals that are trying to stay or trying to get into our healthcare system. We've heard that today with the, with the closures, again, uh, down east of the ER, because, again, of miscommunication, or lack thereof, with a physician who was willing to alleviate some of the pressures that that hospital would have, um, but communications broke down. And I'm hearing that it's, it's too common of an event. Summerside, two physicians I've talked to there, they left, two internists actually left, because of uh, communication or, or lack thereof with uh, health PEI. They wanted to stay here. They, were, they, they wanted to negotiate. Health PEI closed the door on them. Mm. Closed the door on them. So no wonder physicians and, and staff Healthcare staff are leaving this province in droves. It, it's any wonder they're not. They're not made uh, feel like they're welcomed here, or to stay here. And we have to value our healthcare workers. We have to to do everything we can to take away this toxic work environment that has been created. We need to show them that they are valued, and we need to work to recruit and retain staff here on Prince Edward Island. Talk about um, medical centers. The Technician Cooperative Healthcare Center for almost, well, it's almost 50 years now, it's been uh, in operation. It started in the early 70s. A, um, what we did to bring a doctor there, and it was the community that did it. The community said, we're not getting the service that our residents deserve. They went out and they formed a cooperative they fundraised, they built a health center, they went out and they got their own doctor. The doctor was coming to the Tignesh, didn't have a place to stay. The mayor of the day left his own home, took his family and two children out so that the doctor and his wife and their family could move in and have a place to stay so they could start in Tignesh um, and serve the, the public immediately. That doctor remained in Tignesh for 40 years. For 40 years, Dr. Seti was a technician and was a valued member of our community. Um, the work that he, did, that he did is still talked about today. He went above and beyond uh, to provide health care services to, to the community and surrounding areas. Today, we have no physician. We have no nurse practitioners. Um, we have a part-time RN. Uh, RN that comes in, um, and we need to have a physician. I've asked this in the House last week mm -hmm. to see if we could specifically have a billing number to Tignish uh, so that the, uh, once again, the healthcare centre, the cooperative, the community 
and the, the town of Tignish and surrounding area will go out and find their own physician to come there to uh, service the needs of, of locals. Um, without that assurance, they can't make this happen because there's too many barriers. Now, they almost had a doctor, a doctor um, to sign up to come to Tignish, and phew, somehow, internally, that doctor was swooped and taken uh, elsewhere in West Prince. And so and I do have uh, communication uh, via emails uh, from that doctor um, about his uh, desire to come to Tignish, and then again of the, uh, the roadblocks that prevented him from coming, um, which came from health, uh, internally from Health PDI Men's Figure. So we need, to, we need to make a change. We need to be aware of the healthcare needs, not only here in our urban center, uh, in Charlottetown and Summerside, but also in the rural areas of Prince Edward Island. Um, all Islanders deserve access to timely health care, regardless of where you live in Prince Edward Island. And if it takes a community um, to take it upon themselves to roll up their sleeves and get it done, I guess that's what it is. And maybe that's the plan, I'm, I'm not sure. But there still is roadblocks and barriers there that is not allowing them to do so. So I, I will be pushing on this to ask, um, again, uh, the minister to specifically give a billing number to the Tignish Cooperative Health Centre so that they can go out and hire a doctor on their own so that they can provide the service to the residents of Tignish and surrounding area that this government has failed to do. Madam Speaker, the waiting times for essential treatments and surgeries are unacceptably long, resulting in prolonged suffering and compromised health um, outcomes for patients. Overworked healthcare professionals are unable to provide the level of care that they desire, leading to burnout and a decline in the quality of services rendered. Furthermore, the absence of healthcare professionals in rural areas that I just talked about perpetuates a cycle of healthcare inequality. It is our duty as legislators to ensure that all citizens, regardless of their geographic location, have equitable access to quality health care. I would like to start, say it again, that in regard to the intensive care unit at the Prince uh, County Hospital, the closure of their ICU means we have only one ICU in the province, and it is at capacity. That is a scary scary situation, Madam Speaker. That does not put any Islanders' minds to ease. This further means that we will have critical patients, Islanders, lying in places like trauma bays at the QEH as the ICU at the QEH spills over. And why did it close, Madam Speaker? Staff shortages? Shortage of internal medicine specialists. That's what we're hearing. There were internists in Summerside, and I just mentioned two of them, that left, but they wanted to stay here because Health PEI was not open to negotiate with them. What did they say? Go. Basically, come on. You're not valued. Go. Same thing that happened uh, down Is east. Action, do something. Yep. So, then a speaker in Charlottetown, the capital of our province, and the birthplace of Confederation, things are no better than they are in rural Prince Edward Island or in Summerside. The emergency room at the QEH has already seen wait times of more than 8 to 10 hours. And depending on the severity of their issue, um, with critical patients sitting inside the ER, staff are already pushed to the brink. And along with that, it was only re recently that the QEH um, ER was at capacity. And this isn't even the peak tourism season yet, Madam Speaker. The issue has been even more pressing in rural areas. For example, we talked about uh, Kings County uh, Memorial Hospital the ER um, closing now for three months on the weekends. But it just seems even prior to, to today, it was closing um, every, every couple of days. It was closing. It's following the same pattern that happened in West Prince, Madam Speaker. Simply going into Google and looking up the ER will bring up a news article and another news article, and one after another, stating the same thing. Closed due to a lack of staffing. Madam Speaker, we heard uh, recently about the physicians and staff at the ER at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside 
having to put up a notice on the door themselves saying they've reached capacity, please find alternate uh, services for your healthcare needs. That's pretty sad whenever staff have to take it upon themselves to put the sign up on a door because they have concerns over not being able to, uh, because of capacity levels, not being able to provide the service. So saying, please find alter alternate uh, service uh, elsewhere. That is not their responsibility to do that, Madam Speaker. Now, we've been hearing concerns from doctors from around the province who have spoken about the lack of nursing staff. And this creates a domino effect uh, of other nurses becoming burnt out sooner, requiring time off, or leaving the island, or the profession as a whole. And we all, I'm sure, have heard stories of nurses leaving the profession because of the toxic work environment that has been created by this government. And this cannot continue, Madam Speaker. There's a question that, that, that just came to my mind about uh, staff shortages at uh, Kings County Memorial. So if they're, and this is what I'm hearing, they're moving uh, nurses who work in the ER to now work uh, inpatient in, in other areas of the, of the hospital. Let's say through, at the end of the summer, the uh, ER hopefully will be open. But like I said, it may be the same as the slow erosion of service that happened in West Prince that they said it's going to close for three months and it's been closed now since August of last year. So will those nurses be able to come back to the ER then? And if they do, who's going to replace those nurses that were out on the floor working? So these are all questions that need to be answered. These are all, all questions that need to have immediate uh, concern and action. Um, instead of being reactive, this government needs to be proactive. Madam Speaker, to address the pressing issue, it is imperative that we develop um, innovative recruitment campaigns to attract healthcare professionals to our province, with a particular focus on uh, bolstering some of the healthcare workforce in rural areas. And as I said before, we cannot forget about the healthcare service and the timely access that every islander deserves to have, regardless of where you live in this province. Our top three industries are. Farming, fishing, tourism. Farming and fishing primarily uh, are in rural Prince Edward Island, and much of our tourism happens in rural areas of Prince Edward Island. In order to be sustainable and viable, there needs to be families that live in these areas. Residents of the island need to live in these areas to, to work in these industries, to run these industries. Uh, Madam Speaker, and if we don't have health care in those areas, people will leave. If we don't have health care in these areas, people will not come to the audit. So we need to do everything we can to recruit, retain um, health care staff um, everywhere, every, everywhere across this island. Every health care facility on Prince Edward Island at the present time is understaffed. So in addition to attracting professionals, we must invest in a robust support system to retain them. I've talked to physicians that left that said that they do not have the supports and the resources here for them. The demands are great. Health PEI is overwhelming them with demands. They are being burnt out quickly. Um, so supports and resources that issue needs to be addressed. But how will that be addressed when there's no communication? Doctors are leaving. There, it, there are no mandatory exit surveys done here on Prince Edward Island. But what I'm hearing from physicians, uh, they're not even allowed to talk about why they left um, after they leave. So something has to change. We have, in order to fix a problem, you need to know what the problem is. And it's called communication. And that is a huge issue between Health PEI and the Department of Health. There is a huge communication problem. They need to get out. They need to, instead of making decisions uh, behind a desk, get out and get into the uh, front lines. Come on up west. Go down to Montague. 
walk into the hospitals, speak to everybody that works in that facility, every, every bit of staff. They live day in and day out with these issues. They understand them. They may be able to give you just a little bit of advice as to how you could help the system to make it more inviting so that you could recruit more people. They may be able to give you a little bit of advice and direction how to retain the current staff that are there. It's called communication. It's called, it's called understanding what the issues are. You can't make decisions if you don't know what the issues are. Uh, Madam Speaker, with more information, uh, like I just mentioned about the uh, mandatory exit surveys that I think are required here, maybe we can stop the slow drain of our medical professionals here on Prince Edward Island. So I'm going to uh, close here, by, but I'm going to implore all members of this esteemed assembly to support this motion um, because it's through our collective uh, action that we can ensure access to quality health care for all residents on Prince Edward Island, regardless of their geographical location. So let us stand united in our commitment to building a robust and inclusive health care system that serves the need of our province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm proud to stand up and second this motion. It's an important one. We talk about recruitment quite a bit in here and, and you know, if, if we just looked at recruitment in the sense that, hey, you know what, we, this assembly said, hey, you know what, you want to have a, a notion for doctors recruiting doctors, we allowed that to happen. No problem. But then what happened was then, then somebody over there decided to give bonuses to some of the employees and not others, uh, it, it pitting, pitting respiratory therapists against nurses, pitting uh, porters against, you're trying to build a system, but you, you gave, and then you find out that this was because we needed nurses and that's the strategy we had. We need everybody because if you don't treat everybody equally, you end up losing your respiratory therapists and porters and people are working in, in kitchen staffs. And then we're left saying that, hey, you know what, we have a toxic culture within health PEI, we have a toxic culture within different things that are happening there and we need to do this better. I, I would say, how do we recruit people? How do we recruit? Uh, with innovation of ideas, first thing you do is, is make sure those bonuses are equitable across across the system. The people that didn't get the bonuses, you have to give them now the bonuses. Uh, that that's we can't even get to recruiting people unless we treat the people that we have with respect and dignity. And I don't think we did that here. And that's a major that's a major problem. And if you don't think this is serious, because Islanders are talking to us. If you don't think that you're paying attention to motions like these. Um, this is very serious, and it won't take long for the pressures to start to mount where you have four or five hundred people in a, in a meeting uh, in Western PEI saying, hey, you know what, rural health care is important, and we have to stand by it, and we have to do everything we can to support rural health care. And those are happening more and more. Now, if you don't, if you don't keep the, the facilities open in rural aspect, this, this talks about rural. Guess what happens? The stress on the central clogs and the wheels become overwhelming, like they did, oh, let's look for an example, maybe 48 hours ago in our main hospital. And this is what starts to happen. So you need to start to recruit more and you need to recruit across the board. You need dedicated teams, and, and you're, you're wondering how we do dedicated teams in all professions, not just doctors and nurses. You need to be there and ready to go. And if there, it's not stated publicly within the department, that's what we're doing, then th those, those people in those places get left behind. Respiratory therapists, uh, uh, diagnostic uh, image people. You have to make sure you're there. When you have 73 doctors, um, that are that are ready to retire, according to the Peachy report. Um, we we have to take that very seriously. Th these are all things that 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 work in unison. I can't even begin to talk about health promotion, which we need to start to invest in, at another level. Medical homes, for example, why don't they have a proactive approach to medical homes? We don't even know what they are. They're not uniform across the board. Why? Because you can't recruit uniformly across the board, have 16 medical homes with, uh, with, with doctors filling different positions. You, that's, what, that's what's happening. You need to make sure that those are proactive, where people can go and get the care they need, like kinesiologists, 
like OTs, like kinesiologist assistants. These are things that we haven't talked about before, but if we're going to be proactive, we have to make sure we expand our scope of how we're recruiting and how we're trying to keep people healthy. The, some of the things that, that you, we, we dabble with now but need to be, be strategized is childcare spaces. You can't recruit doctors here. The first thing they're going to ask you to do is I'm coming with two kids, young kids under the age of two. Um, I just got out of med school. I'm going to a place where my kids are taken care of, where they can get into childcare spaces, where they can d d have a home that I can have for my family. We can't do that right now. So a universal, this is, this is innovative recruitment campaigns have to be done now and we have to start looking at those. We must have housing for people. When, when places like Hillsborough Hospital has 64 beds and, not, and 42 being operational, these are important things that we need to get up to full capacity, but we can't, why? Because we're, we're drowning and we're, we're swimming in not being able to recruit, and when, we, when people come here, we're not, we're not doing a very good job of retaining them well. And this is what they're said. This is what's being said to me at PE Home, at Beach Grove Home, at Garden Home that are in my communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to start talking more and more passionately about this because after four years on this side, I, I probably have talked about this subject more and listened to this subject more. And I don't see the concrete innovative solutions that we really need. And the final thing I'll say before I pass the floor is that we did get money from the federal government and that's targeted money for different areas. If we and if this government doesn't have a plan in place to spend that money, guess who will? The other provinces who got even more money because they're bigger provinces. They got millions and millions of dollars too as well. And guess what they're going to do with their money? They're going to go out and recruit the, the people that they don't have. And if we don't have a plan for the way we're going to spend that money, um, and it's got to be tight, it's got to be up to date, and we've got to do it now, we're going to fall behind. Case in point, what Nova Scotia did for their nurses. And we all saw it a few months ago where they came out and said, here we go, boom, just like that, $10,000 bonuses. And they didn't stop there, they kept going. What did we did? We said we have good, solid programs to recruit nurses. And we, I don't know if we do. I don't know if they now match up. We have to stay current, flexible, and ready to move. A plan, you have to have a plan, you have to pay for these services, and you have to appreciate them. And those are the things that, that this motion does. And the last thing I'll talk about, underrepresented groups in here, it's in here for a reason. Somebody, some, a friend of mine came uh, up from the Bahamas, brought her daughter up. Okay, she's a mature student. She went through a Holland College program to become a healthcare worker. Came up here and, and grinded, worked at Tim Hortons, worked wherever she could, volunteered for her community, and raised her daughter right here at Queen Charlotte in a new place, and it was very difficult for them. But the programs at Holland College were good enough where now I can proudly say that this person decided to stay in Prince Edward Island. This person, think about that, this person decided to stay in Prince Edward Island. She is now working in our healthcare field and you know what the daughter is doing? You know what the daughter is doing because she came in as a mature student? She's enrolled in Holland College to become a healthcare professional. It, it's, it's a very good, and it's a very good success story. But this is one, I have to be talking, I have to be using two different hands, three different, whatever. It has to be hundreds of people where we value people coming in that can work in the future, so they're there. And this is a very good success story. But we have to do everything we can to maintain and have more success stories like that, because that is the solution to um, a positive recruitment strategy. So this is just, that, that was really successful, and I'm so proud of her, and I know where she works, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of her, she's dedicated, and this will, this will be how we transform our system, Madam Speaker. So I'm just excited to talk about this motion because it's very, very important. So I'll pass the floor right now, and uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for this motion. Uh, Madam Speaker, recruitment and retention of skilled health care workers remains a top priority for our government. We're extremely fortunate to have value partners who work with us as we face hiring challenges. 
within the healthcare system, health PEI, post-secondary institutions, medical colleges, and more. We also benefit from the efforts of agencies like Immigrant and Refugee Services Association who help newcomers settle successfully in our province. Madam Speaker, the sources of many challenges in the healthcare system now stems from staffings that we are experiencing. It is important that we continue to recruit staff to fill vacant positions and new positions. And we also make efforts to retain the skilled people who are working within our system. Madam Speaker, both tasks are critically important. We are offering free tuition to a range of health care workers, and when these individuals graduate and are ready to enter the workforce, we, we will be ready with job opportunities for them. Health staff are working harder than ever on both recruitment and retention, but there's always more to be done. The Department of Health and Wellness develops, administers, and evaluates programs for hard to recruit health and social care and what we call allied health professionals. This is on the top of the efforts to bring in new doctors and nurses. In addition to doctors and nurses, other recruitments effort have focused on filling full-time positions, hard to recruit vacancies for social workers, psychologists, pharmacy technicians, medical lab technologists, midwives, and various other roles across the province. The Department of Health and Wellness delivers an RN bridging and re-entry program in partnership with the Nova Scotia Health Learning Institute for Healthcare Providers, and we are working to expand on this. This program supports internationally educated nurses and Canadian educated re-entry nurses as they address the educational and practical gaps and work to obtain their RN registration. Overall, 25 nurses have completed this program. That's 25 people who, have, who we have helped overcome barriers to practicing as registered nurses on PEI, and these people are now helping to care for Islanders. I will give credit to the federal government. Last Wednesday, I believe, Minister Klo sent me a note that they have the first ever category-based selection process under the Express Entry Program for healthcare workers. So our federal partners are expediting entry of foreign healthcare workers into our country, which is a great thing and much needed. I do want to talk about nurses a little bit. Um, and I, I understand the recruitment challenges, so when I became minister, the first thing I did was look at recruitment. So I almost did it myself. In 2000, and, and I do not like this narrative because it is incorrect, absolutely incorrect, Madam Speaker. In 2022, there were 73 graduates from the UPEI School of Nursing. 14 of the 73 were from out of province, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Vietnam, and China. So I asked the department, took the graduation list, and said, who are we currently paying at Health PEI? 55 of those nurses are employed by Health PEI. 55. So it, again, I don't want to use the word fear mongering and all that, but we do have recruitment staff who are working hard. So to say we're not talking to our nurses is absolutely incorrect. It is incorrect. So, and again, we will never be 100%. My own daughter, I don't believe, will practice nursing on PEI. They do want to leave see the big bad world, and so on and so forth. But I will take 55 of 73 any day from, a pers from that perspective. That was about two months old, so I know you guys like your data. So as of eight weeks ago, it was about 55, because I personally looked at what are we doing for our nursing hiring. About a month ago, I asked about this year's class. And at that time, we had made 39 offers. We had, what's that? Madam Speaker, just getting going. It's your debate. <laughs> Save by the bell. Save by the bell over there. Yeah. I was talking through with a towel. That's good. That's nice. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, I call that motion eight now be read. Shall it carry? Carry, Madam Speaker, motion number eight is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the mover, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Speaker. So I, I think I'll start by saying uh, to the Minister of Health and Wellness, 
keep your notes in front of you because this motion is very similar to the previous one, so you can carry on with your thoughts as soon as your turn comes up here. Yeah, just hold them there. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. And we did begin debate on this motion uh, last week, I believe it was. And uh, I'm very delighted to get back up again and conclude my remarks. I talked last time um, about, I mean, the, the, a lot has been said already regarding uh, recruitment here this afternoon. Uh, but of course, recruitment uh, and retention are intimately linked. And uh, as the member from Charlottetown West Royalty started his remarks by saying, we talk a lot about retention in this house. Uh, sorry, we talk a lot about recruitment in this house. And that's true, and, and that's really my issue with the previous motion that we were just discussing, is that the operative clauses are entirely to do with recruitment. And we know that's important. Of course it's important. And uh, I appreciate the statistics that the minister just brought forward with the nursing program at UPEI. But we all know that retention in, is, in many respects, far more important. Uh, because how many of those 55 uh, who stayed here from that graduating class will be here a year from now, or two years from now, or five years from now? That's the really critical metric that we need to follow. Because we know that replacing, uh, for example, a nurse with 10 years' experience with a new graduate, you're not replacing the same thing. Um, experience, as we all know, in any part of our lives is just such an invaluable thing in terms of being able to do our job, whether that's as a legislator or as uh, a manager of a golf program in a province or a school counselor or a dentist or whatever you are. Experience is an enormously important part of being able to do your job well. And you do not step into a job, particularly a complicated job, like and all frontline healthcare worker jobs are complicated, um, and do the same level of work with the same level of efficiency as somebody who's been there for many, many years. So um, I'm a little bit off track here because I'm talking about the previous motion in a sense, but I, I would like to point out that the operative clauses in motion eight, one is related to recruitment, the other is related to retention, and we must never forget that those two things work together hand in hand. And I would argue that retention is the thing that we should be focusing on primarily because that's where the, the real knowledge and the skills and the experience within the healthcare system sit. One of the things that we hear a lot, and I don't want to speak for too long today because I, I didn't speak for 10 minutes or so last time, and I'm, I'm anxious to let the minister conclude his remarks. Um, I'm also anxious to hear from others in this House. And, and while we didn't get to a vote on the previous motion, um, the similarities between them are, are they're fairly, they're fairly close. And I think it would be good to get a sense of this House's thoughts on uh, recruitment and retention and the importance of that to the future of our healthcare system here. Um, so is government to blame for the situation we find ourselves in today? Well, not entirely, but are they partially to blame? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We, we know that the vacancy rate here on Prince Edward Island is about 20% for frontline healthcare workers, which is twice the national average. 10% is not good, um, but 20% is really concerning. And it is why we are struggling with issues like ERs being over capacity, with people not being able to gain access to primary health care through a GP or a nurse practitioner, why people are experiencing longer than national average wait times for test, testing um, and for surgeries, and why our walk-in clinics and our emergency rooms across this province are clogged as badly as they are. It's because we do not have enough frontline workers. And, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was the leader of the official opposition in talking to his motion, that the divisive retention bonus scandal that happened uh, last year was, was really hurtful, um, a terribly thought out policy 
which divided healthcare workers, which, uh, and I think I've mentioned this in the House before, but I, during the campaign I stopped at a, a nurse's door, uh, an experienced nurse's door, actually. This, her story would fit in with what I was saying earlier about the need to make sure that we retain our experienced workers, a nurse of 20 years experience who was uh, very adamant that she was going to leave the system, not of retirement age at all, but because of the stresses uh, that she's experienced personally and the, the struggles that she now has to provide the level of care that she would like to do, um, she was very seriously considering leaving. Anyway, the, what, I, what I wanted to say is that she was one that actually received that bonus, but she was, I think, perhaps equally uncomfortable um, as those that did not receive it. I mean, a very different emotion, of course. She. She had the money in her pocket, although much of that was, was clawed back through taxation, the way that it, it was done. But she knew she had to go to work every day and face people who were working alongside her and on, on whom she depended, who did not receive that same bonus. And that's a very difficult, and through no fault of her own, it wasn't her decision, it was a decision that came directly from the fifth floor from the Premier's office, we know that. Um, and when you have a premier who's interfering to that extent and creating that degree of divisiveness and ill feeling between workers in a system that is already stressed, you are throwing gasoline on a, a fire. And, and it, it, was a, it was a terrible decision. Here, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I couldn't stop myself. It, it, it just it shocks me, and it shocked, I think, many people in the system that that was ever done. So we can say that recruitment here on Prince Edward Island um, is challenging and as I said a minute ago the government isn't totally responsible for that but they are par partially to blame absolutely and one of the reasons or one of the areas where there could be huge improvements here on the government side is in the processes that we use for new medical whether they're nurses from UPEI or doctors from another continent or nurse practitioners from the States or another province here in Canada. The recruitment process is unbelievably complicated and multi-layered. Um, I've seen the flow chart which compares the processes that are done in, in Nova Scotia to hire new healthcare workers compared to the one that we use here. Uh, in Prince Edward Island, and it was it, it was like night and day. The process in Nova Scotia, I think there were like four boxes in the, in the flow chart, and very few people involved. And this is a province, of course, with a population, I think it's six times the size of, of PEI. Anyway, considerably larger than ours. And here in PEI, if you look at the flow chart of how we, somebody who wants to come here enters that process and the system to become registered as a healthcare worker here, it looks like um, it looks like an IKEA diagram for building a kitchen. That that's the level of complexity we're looking at. I think there were 17. I could be amazed, be more than that. 17 boxes um, straddling three different um, entities: the public school, uh, sorry, the, the the Department of Health and Wellness. Health PEI and the, um, oh my God, yes, yes, thank you, exactly. And while those entities are, you know, obviously all contained within government, the, there's no need for that level of complexity. And that's an area where streamlining has no impact on the quality of the, of, of the very important um, processes to make sure that those who come here are properly licensed and ready to work and all that stuff. It would, not, it would not impact that at all in terms of its, its effectiveness, but my goodness, it would improve efficiency of that. And um, I know that there are frustrations within the health department. There are certainly frustrations from physicians. I spoke to one who I spent a lot of time with during the last campaign who wanted to come here, and I'm going back 20 years now, um, and they said they almost gave up on coming to PEI. They're, uh, their partner was also coming to PEI and had secured a good job. And this was a general practitioner, very well-respected GP with, with uh, Canadian credentials uh, and, and a, a very well-respected. And because of the complexity and all of the 
the, the issues that they ran into in terms of getting a license to come here and work, almost gave up. And that's the sort of thing we absolutely get, must get rid of in our system. So there, there are a lot of things that I, I think this government could improve and, and make easier. And when I think back to the legislation that the minister recently brought forward to amend the Regulated Health Professions Act, and that was designed to make it easier to recruit healthcare professionals, that was a, a, you know, that was a useful thing. It, it made it um, not necessary anymore for those health professionals to come forward with a letter of good standing from every jurisdiction in which they had, had worked. Clearly a, a sort of a level of bureaucracy and red tape which probably did not serve in any way the the process of making sure that people who come here to work as healthcare workers are safe and, and are, are worthy people to, to work in the system. But you know what? We could have gone further, and I, um, I haven't heard anything, um, any indication that those changes were, you know, important though they were, um, are actually going to make a, a meaningful difference in the, in the bottleneck, that IKEA diagram of a kitchen that I just tried to describe. Um, as far as I'm aware, the complex processes and the fees associated with it are still going to remain, and they're still going to impact the ability of us to recruit the professionals that we need. Um, uh, electronic health records is something I've talked about frequently in this House, and we know that we're struggling with that. We know that we have a, a proprietary uh, system which is not used anywhere else and which is causing, rather than increased efficiency and less clerical time on behalf of the, of the users, quite the opposite, actually. And that's the sort of thing which, again, government isn't to blame entirely for the, for the issues that we're having here, but they're partly to blame, and that's an area where we should have done better. We should have made a better decision up front. We should, I, I still don't understand, and nobody has ever explained to me or convinced me why we did not go with the Talus product that six or seven other provinces are using successfully and chose to push forward with this new, untried, and now we find out cumbersome and inefficient EHR system. Whether it's too late to turn around and we would be creating more work for ourselves than it would be worth to, to look at a new system, I don't know the answer to that. But it, it really upsets me that, that we made bad decisions up front which are causing all kinds of problems now. And we know that at least one physician here on, pre, on PEI uh, who is about to leave stated that the primary reason for him doing that was because of the state of the EMR. So time and again, uh, the Premier and the Minister of Health have continued to not do what the frontline workers here on PEI have asked them to do. And instead, they've embarked on uh, poorly thought out projects that rather than enhance the process and improve the culture within the healthcare system, do quite the opposite. We need a government that is there to support our healthcare workers. We need a government that starts making good decisions we need a government that recognizes that retention sits above recruitment. We need both, but we cannot ignore the detrimental impacts that a lack of, a lack of a strong retention policy has here. And it's not so much a policy, it's creating a culture, it's creating a system that people want to come here and work rather than having a system which is driving people away, and that is the real problem here. So I really look forward to hearing others speak to this motion. Um, I ask that you all support it. I don't think there's anybody in this House that would deny that we have issues in terms of the number of healthcare workers, the human resources that we have in the system. We need to improve it. This does not say that government is the sole, um, the sole response or reason why we are in this jam that we're in now, but it does say that government needs to acknowledge the problems that we have and to bring forward constructive, comprehensive, and effective solutions to make this healthcare system better. I look forward to hearing others speak and to support for this motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, before I, I jump into my prepared 
comments, something that the, the leader of the third party said kind of jumped out at me, and that is if we don't acknowledge the problem, well, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but if we don't acknowledge the problem, how do we ever move forward? And this is something, you know, I'll compare government to, to teaching children things when I think that's exactly what I'm working on with my 10-year-old son right now is, you know, he was feeling pretty bad about something that happened and I said, well, we've identified the problem and now we know what to work on. That's a good thing. And so it's just unfortunate. This problem has been identified for so long and time keeps chugging along and the health care crisis just seems to deepen and there's no real reprieve for islanders and fear and anxiety continues to grow and um, I know myself I live in a in a I'm not going to say a constant state but a, a, a constant state of waves of of anxiety anyway when I think about this and for me my brain really loves when I first wake up in the morning to throw things at it that I, I have absolutely no control over and to think about and to worry about and this is one of them I think about um, my dad, who lives with COPD, my mom, who is having some pretty, quite severe leg issues right now and lives with asthma. Um, I think about the fact that my son is quite a daredevil sometimes, and you know, it's just a, a matter of time before you require ser emergency services at a hospital. And you know, something that I believe we've all taken for granted our whole lives is that that care was there in a timely manner. And now, you know, we've got these wonderful healthcare professionals who are there, um, not in the numbers they once were, and not able to offer that timely care. And, you know, I, people are terrified. And we've, we've heard stories again and again about people who go in with, with life-threatening um, uh, symptoms and not sure how long that will take and will they get care in time. And that, that is what we all care about, and that is what we are all working towards. And I would like to see more urgency and more, you know, if there are things happening in retention, we should be talking about them and sharing them so that people know. You know, there's all kinds of examples of things happening, whether it be programs or services in government that people, you know, we hear all the time, well, the numbers of people accessing it are really low, but if we don't communicate them, of course they're going to be low because people don't know about them. So government needs to do a better job at communicating, A, what programs and services are available, and B, what they are doing in these areas, because retention and recruitment are the most important things in healthcare right now. And so whatever we're doing, we need to talk about them. And one of, a growing thing that, that I'm noticing with with government right now is kind of shirking responsibility here and rather than standing up and acknowledging the problem, jumping to what they are doing, which is, you know, great. You're doing something, share that. That's what I'm asking for. And at the same time, you can't just put your flag in that and call it a done deal because there's still a whole bunch of work to do because Islanders are not feeling any sort of relief right now in, in their health care delivery that they may receive in a, in a timely manner. And as was mentioned before, we know that gov this government did not create this crisis, um, but they seem really hard pressed to even start muddling our way out of this health care crisis as a province. And even some of the lowest hanging fruit continues to be ignored by this government. And I, I, I'd like to know how many times I've gotten up here and said the, the next few things that I'm going to say. We, despite what, you know, what we heard the minister say, we still hear examples of frontline healthcare workers being ignored. We're ignoring them. We're not listening to the fact that there's violence in the workplace, that the workplace cultures are toxic, that the wages just aren't there, that the retention programs and offerings are inequitable. We just don't acknowledge it. We just keep forging ahead. And when you forge ahead and don't learn from your mistakes, history repeats itself. And we see ourselves in a lot of that, that history repeating itself in so many other areas of, of our world right now. And it's really scary. And so as I talked about in my throne speech uh, message, that we need boldness and we need courage and creativity from government. And I still don't see a government standing up to do that. And 
you know, I, I keep hearing, oh, once the budget passes, <coughs> once the budget passes, well, holy cow, by the sounds of things, our world is going to change drastically once this budget passes. But I don't believe that, unfortunately. I wish that were the case. I really do. The fact, when I mentioned um, government kind of shirking responsibility in some areas, is the feeling that I get. Um, you know, it's, we talk about, and something we hear government say, and an example of how we shirk our responsibility, our government shirks its responsibility, is to say, oh, it's <laughs> happening all over the country. Well, yes, it is. And it's significantly worse here, and we know that. And when we consider things like what the leader of the third party mentioned about the IKEA kitchen uh, instructions, how complicated it is for healthcare workers here to get hired versus other places, that's a problem. Why aren't we looking at that as the lowest hanging fruit that we could possibly pick? Um, another low hanging fruit is, um, is, you know, the Health Services Act which I feel like a bit like a broken record because I keep saying if there's any other reason other than political gain for government to not look at this Health Services Act, share it with me, please call me out wrong. I'll go on every social media platform. I'll go to the media and tell them I was wrong. But no one has come to me and explained it. So the only thing to draw is that by not changing Health Services Act, by not streamlining health care hiring processes to make it easier, to not give more autonomy to Health PEI to do the hiring, to trust them with the hiring, there's political advantage for you in there somewhere. Um, we often hear about, um, so get, when we're talking specifically about retention, um, vacations. Can you imagine working through a worldwide pandemic, working your butts off, not being able to go home from your family, having to sleep in a camper in your yard the whole time so as to not pass on a deadly virus to your family, and not being able to take a vacation for two weeks? There are ways that we can fill those positions to let people take those vacations. And we hear lots of examples from frontline healthcare workers. So if we hear in this legislative assembly, or when we're done sitting, whenever, if we hear this summer that there are no healthcare vacations for our frontline healthcare workers, that is shameful. They want to be valued. And what says we don't value you more than saying, sorry, you don't get a vacation this year. Oh, I'm sorry, we're calling you to come into work. You're at a family reunion. We need you in here right now. The anxiety and the toll on a person's mental health when you're on call all the time. Because when I was out door knocking and when people reach out to me, healthcare workers saying, I feel like I'm on call all the time because my phone rings. When I'm not working, I am guaranteed my phone is going to ring at least once. What a terrible way to live. You know, I have said this in here a few times too, and I find myself saying it again. The definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. Let's be creative and let's be bold. In speaking about valuing healthcare workers, I, I won't spend much time here because we've gone back here so many times and the honorable leader of the third party did the same, was that retention bonus scandal because that is what it was. Talk about having your hands in the cookie jar. And I don't want to keep saying this, but again, no one has suggested to me anything different about government not having something to gain by not changing the Health Services Act to give more autonomy to health PEI so they can hire. Take that 17-step process down to four, there you go. Seems very easy. Yet, we didn't take, the Premier did not take a decision, his idea, or government's idea, of a good retention uh, bonus to give to some and not to others. It has caused a division that has yet to be repaired.
We have nurses contacting us on a regular basis about having to fight for their, um, the retention incentive that they were promised a year ago. They are still fighting for their incentive that they were approved for a year ago. Yep, we value you, and this is how we show it through our actions. The track record of promising, rolling things out, and not delivering of this government just keeps happening again and again and again, and it is frustrating. Um, we hear healthcare workers coming here from larger jurisdictions, and they are telling us how complicated our system is. That there is so much bureaucracy and red tape, and they come from big jurisdictions where you would expect to see more complicated practices. They're coming to little old PEI and seeing these ridiculous, complicated hiring practices. And, you know, talking about Health Services Act here once again. Everything seems to come back to that. In every healthcare chat that I have with, whether it be friends, family, constituents, islanders in general, it comes back to that, is why are our, why are our hiring practices so complicated? And I've told the story in here before of um, uh, friends of mine, I was talking to two, two friends, both of them had, one had one family, a doctor in their family who wanted to come back to PEI, one had two. They contacted Health PEI well over a year ago and still have heard nothing back. Why? Why? We are in a health crisis. We should be jumping at them. We should be saying, yes, yes, of course, yep, let's talk. Let's talk should be our first answer. I will happily give you those names. Because why, why should I, but, and that's another frustrating, I appreciate that you want those names, but why do I have to be the one to give them to you if they have reached out to you? I guess maybe one of the reasons could be, the reason the other day I was looking for um, an email, this happens for all ministers, I'm not picking on this one, but the Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Attorney General and Deputy Premier, I texted him the other day and said, Minister, there are four emails on your name, which one should I use? <laughs> and they don't take it off the, the thing. Website. And even even emails that are on the website that you use, they they just like ah ah. There are doctors trying to come here, and they don't know which of your four emails to use. That is a problem. Just give it your cell number. You're the answer. Like seriously, this is absurd. It is absurd. But here we are. Here we are. Um, um, so we know, we know what needs to be done, and I guess now top on the list is making sure emails are updated on the websites. Um, you know, while you're at it, you could update some of the programs that you said were changed a couple of years ago that are still the same on the websites. It's so frustrating. Um, so it certainly does not inspire confidence. None of this inspires confidence that this government is going to even start guiding us, guiding the way out of this health care crisis. I want you to. I support you to. I really do. I'm trying to give you ideas, but... When it comes from over here, they're just not good ideas, I guess. So this motion's calling for two things. One is around streamlining processes and recruitment. And one of the things that we know that was, has been brought to my attention, attention on several occasions, and I know that we brought forward motions in the last Legislative Assembly that government did take in terms of whether it be supporting bridging programs for in certain nursing programs or offering free um, education uh, to people going into health care. In jurisdictions where we're doing this for all health care providers, including registered nurses and doctors, where we're paying for their education, and in turn, asking them to provide so many years of service here. You know, those are good ideas. And the thing is, when we, and that's another, the, the, the motion that came before us, we can't put the horse before the cart. If we don't value and listen to healthcare professionals, how are we ever gonna recruit them and keep them? If we don't fix retention, we needn't bother recruiting because we're not going to be able to keep them. So while we're working on these two things at the same time, I really hope government is putting a strong 
emphasis on retention. Um, one of the other things that, you know, would help us a long way in retention is the uh, EMR, our medical records. What's that? Seriously, what is that? That you have to fax. That you ha like, why are we not oh, okay. listening to healthcare professionals who tell us, they tell us, we in here are not healthcare professionals. But guess what? We have really important jobs. We are the ones who are the leaders and the guiding of these, of these systems. And we know that our systems are broken everywhere. And yet we sit in our chairs and we talk. Anyway, so with that, Madam <laughs> Speaker, I encourage, what's that? No way, I will not drink chocolate milk in this house. <laughs> I'd love chocolate milk, but I can't, oh, I can't drink it in here. Um, with that, Madam Speaker, I encourage government to take some of the ideas that have come from health care providers. If you don't want to listen to us, that's fine. But please listen to our frontline health care workers. Please listen to Health PEI. Please. You've had several chairs, two chairs, step down and tell you why. And we're still sitting here with our hand in the cookie jar. So with that, Madam Speaker, I look forward to hearing what others have to say. If I have said anything incorrect, I look forward to being corrected. I really do. Because the only way we can acknowledge there's a problem is if we acknowledge it. So thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, Minister of Health and Wellness. <laughs> Gonna need a new hip, Mr. Um, Madam Speaker. <laughs> oh, feel like a yo-yo these days. Um, <laughs> well, I get mine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go together, two for one. Um, just to finish a little bit of my nursing uh, discussion that I had there, and, and again, back to the honorable member's questions, that it's important that um, we stick with the facts. I think sometimes here, say, I use broken telephone sometimes in the office that, you know, I heard from somebody who said to somebody that we didn't get back to them. So please send me names. Please, I want to understand if there's systemic issues um, in our hiring progr uh, pro uh, programs. I had a medical student, again, who came to me from one of our own caucus, and I asked recruitment about it, and their answer was, we are harassing him. Like, and, and the same conversation, nobody's getting out to them. So it was a relative, again, I, I used the, the, the broken telephone, and I think the relative wants him to practice more PEI than maybe he does, but anyway, but I'll use that as an example, is that I reached out on that particular name, and, and the answer was, Mark, we're almost, we're, 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 it's pretty much borderline harassment with that a certain person. Um, so again, I, I do acknowledge the recruitment part. Um, to continue on the nursing theme, we have made changes there where it's, it's now one portal for nursing applications. So you go online and you apply to be a nurse and then we will qualify you. You don't need to reapply. Um, so I think that's a big step. I think it was about April. So we, you, don't have to post, you don't have to apply for job 774-72-2 and then do another one. You actually go into a pool. Um, so I think that's been a very effective move, uh, move for our recruiting um, from that perspective. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good step forward. Um, what other things? I, I think another thing, again, as you learn more in this job and you spend time, I had some time to spend with one of the recruitment staff on the drive to Alberton the other night. So we had a long chat about that. So a couple things that I didn't realize is that we do not have access to lists at universities of who's actually at med school, back to privacy. You know, we, they don't provide that. That, that, that's what you, I was told, again, uh, it would make sense. I mean, I don't think that engineers, it's public. Obviously, you could probably dig and find out who is there, but we don't have access all the time to who's actually at Dow, who's at Mon, who's at McGill. Um, secondly, another thing I learned in that, in that discussion was on the recruitment side is that some campuses do not let our recruitment team on, on, on campus. We have to do some of our events off campus. So again, that is a challenge to get in front of those healthcare uh, learners, um, um, you know, out, off, off campus. I'm, I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, but that's some, in some institutions, that's just their rules and, and we do follow, uh, follow by them. Um, I think we need to do a better job of, of talking about recruitment trips. I know we've gone to Ireland twice in the last three years because that uh, seems to be, we've had some success in, in Ireland. Um, I don't know if that's been out in the public. So again, I'm kind of going off, off, uh, off notes here, 
um, again, with, with regards to, to recruitment. I think the big takeaway for me is that I want to understand the process, and I've always asked my own caucus to, to give me names and number. And so far, I haven't identified really any systemic issues. It's been most one human error, and we all, we all do that. Um, sometimes emails go to junk, so on and so forth. So um, it's important that we continue to, to look at look at it. And that's why I dove into that nursing question myself personally. Uh, the graduation list was online. Um, it was pretty, we, we now track educational institutions, I believe. We didn't before of where they come from. So again, kind of an obvious thing, but I think we need to start doing that. Anyway, <laughs> Madam Speaker, so I rise today in support of this motion. As we deal with the staffing shortages in healthcare system, it is important that we continue to both recruit staff to fill vacant and new positions and we also retain the highly skilled working staff in our system. Madam Speaker, both are critically important. Staff in our department are continuously working to recruit skilled physicians and nurses, while also administering and evaluating programs for hard to recruit positions. Another anecdotal story from my conversation with the recruitment, head of recruitment, is we've all seen what Nova Scotia has done and the, the, the mass stream of applicants that they've had internationally, I think it's 10,000. Good. There's actually companies out there that you can buy credentials to be a nurse and so on. So again, we have to proceed safely. We have to ensure that they're credentialed properly and all that. Again, that was a little bit of an eye-opener for me is that we have to walk before we run on ensuring that they have the training that they say they do um, and that they can perform the tasks within our system the way we expect that to be done. So again, didn't, under, didn't realize that um, in, in, in talking to... Uh, uh, the head of recruitment uh, in our drive at last two nights ago. Um, so Health PI, again, works with our health care workers um, we have working across the province, so we, we can retain the experienced professions that we have. Recruitment efforts have been focused on filling these full-time permanent hard-to-recruit vacancies. I think we've seen it in the nursing contract that we need to incentivize all of our health care workers to work uh, as much as possible, we understand the work-life balance, but uh, again, if, uh, if we need to incentivize those, pe those workers to work, you know, maybe move from 0.5 to 0.6 or whatever that, that total may be to help fill those gaps in our system. So I think from a collective bargaining agreement, uh, we need to look at that back to the master agreement with our physicians. I think we need to incentivize the behaviors um, that work within our new system. Um, so again, not to refer to the budget, but back to the budget, we are going to invest in uh, reopening the master agreement, and, and that's a lot of work. It's, 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 it's very complex, but in order to ensure that those incentives are properly aligned with, with doctors who want to come to Prince Edward Island and practice here. Um, in the fall of 2022, the Recruitment and Retention Secretariat held face-to-face -face presentations with more than 40 students and masters in social, works social work programs in universities in Ontario. So we understand that this is a gap in our system. So again, back to recruiting trips um, that our staff has made. We are trying to get in front of as many healthcare workers as we can. We all know about the bridging program that I talked about previously that we're working to shorten that time so that um, nurses can practice um, internationally trained or uh, nurses can practice faster. But we all know as our population continues to grow, so does the need for a stronger, robust, robust health care system. The, P, uh, the Peachy Report is a very important document. Um, it would have been nice to have that a long time ago. Um, saying, what is that saying? The lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on our, on our part. That is not true in this case. It is an emergency. The lack of planning, we are paying for it. Um, again, it is difficult to actually qualify why physicians are leaving. There's lots of reasons, but in some of the data that I've asked for in the last four years, it's approximately 40. So again, we have, we have aging doctors who are approaching retirement. We should have seen that coming years ago and, and begin to staff up in realization. We continue to work through um, that bubble, so to speak, and we all recognize that the doctors of the past um, were superhuman uh, with their patient loads and, and, the, and the efforts that they did, and that the, you know, in the new, the new proper world of work-life balance that we need to over-recruit to replace those lost physicians. I agree with the honorable members that we want to address retention issues. 
we have to talk to our employees about the challenges they have for working in our system. So, Madam Speaker, in fact, over the summer, I will be visiting facilities over the summer months to connect with those working on the front lines personally. I do want to hear their stories, concerns, and firsthand. I think it's very important. Health PEI leadership recognize employees want improvements with their current working environments and they want to see change. Labor shortages and staffing issues within PEI's healthcare sector and across the country are real and we must all work together to ensure that the engagement and continued retention and recruitment of staff. They talk about at Health PEI re recruitment and retention, they also want to, to add the words engagement. We need to talk about engagement. Those three words need to go together with our healthcare professionals, so we're going to need to continually engage them um, so that we can retain and, uh, and recruit them. By listening to the feedback from our employees, we will work on creating a healthier culture for staff in all roles at all levels. Improving access to primary care for service, services for Islanders is our top priority. Adequate staffing is vital for us to achieve this goal. Health PEI and Health and Wellness are working together to develop a physician resource plan. Health, uh, with regards to the PEACHA report, and I'm not sure we did have a town hall uh, to allow the healthcare field to provide feedback on the PEACHA report and how, we may, how it may uh, impact their lives and, and what they see that may be pertinent that, that you know, again, a consultant might not, not have seen. So that was a very positive um, meeting and approach. I believe they had two town halls and they got some great feedback. On, on that report. We also are identifying positions who intend to retire in the coming years or leave the province for other opportunities so that recruitment efforts to transition patients from one, one provider to another can begin earlier. For those physicians with large family practices, Health PEI will be exploring opportunities to integrate additional supports to build more collaborative practices. With the introduction of patient medical homes, physicians are moving to a team-based collaborative care model this will ensure that all patients are supported by a robust medical team. We all know that physicians and other health care workers want to work in collaborative practices like this. And to attract these workers, we must continue with our plans for these collaborative practices. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the question of human resources in health care is one of the most pressing ones that we face. Many challenges stem back to this concern. We will try to address these, the challenge systematically in cooperation with Health PEI and with various professions delivering health care to Islanders. We strive to ensure the right people are in the right place to service Islanders who use our medical homes and other services, and we will work with our professionals to make sure their scope of practice allows each to make full use of their abilities. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, I support this motion. Thank you. member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. So I'll talk really quickly, <clears throat> Madam Speaker. Um, there are uh, just some things. Thanks, Minister, for, you know, uh, speaking speaking off the cuff. I think that's what Islanders want to want to hear at different times. But there is there is systemic issues, and they're, they're apparent. Um, critically important, we talked about uh, lack of planning and, and that you, you did plan, and, and now there is an emergency. Well, I'm going through the uh, speech from the throne in 2021, and, it, and it, it talks about these things. You talk about we can't get access to nurse and grads, but in here my government announced a three initiative to address this issue. First, it will establish a working group made up of representatives from Holland College, GPI, and Health PEI, and the nurses' professions. This is in your speech from the throne. Um, so to say that we, we, we can't have access to those lists doesn't make sense. You, you have a working group. Um, next thing, my government will immediately, this is from 2021, establish a $5 million fund for recruitment of nurses and nurse practitioners over the next five years. I mean, we, we're talking about this issue like we're just, we're, we're just starting to dabble into it. That's not the case. This has been going on for years. So we, we, we either have to acknowledge that what was working wasn't working and shift, or we have, to, we have to do a lot better. And I believe more that everybody is involved in this. I don't, I, don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to the arguments about taking, <coughs> taking the minister out and making, making different things. There's, 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 it's, that's another debate for another time. But I want to be able to, to talk to you about these issues, about things that are putting the speech from the throne like they were going to solve the issues. And here we are, and they're, they, they, haven't, they haven't really solved much. 
In that document, it says change will not happen overnight. The process is designed to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary. We need both right now. We need we need to revolutionize this system. Um, it does have to evolve with the care, and we have to do better uh, across the board. So two bit important motions today about uh, and the final thing you said was about engagement, and I think that. Minister, you might be the one to do it, and I think that like going up west and, and being there and 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 um, you know listening to the people is important. But I'm also hearing from the nurses union that says that uh, for four years they've had a tough time talking to this government. They can't get meetings, they can't get calls back, they can't get letters, they can't get. Well, it, it is true because it's coming to them from various different unions. So it doesn't happen uniformly across the board. So you can start to the member you can, has the the member has the floor. You, well, I, I, I'm just saying that that these this is the information that that I'm getting and and from different people and and I, I what I said was I do believe the minister might be the one to do it and he could be the one to do it. But we this is a debatable this is a debatable motion and issue and this is one of the hard, hardest and most pressing issues of our time. So. Um, I want to say you, you have to continue to look at going across the province, talk to the unions, and, and make sure that we're, we're continuing to do this because en engagement has been lacking. I'm sorry. It's been lacking from this government. And, and I want to re reassert that. And maybe across the board, and I know, Minister, you worked hard at a lot of different files, but there has to be a time where somebody stands up and says, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. Our health care system is in desperate need. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Is there anyone else to speak to the motion? The leader of the third party to adjourn debate. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the comments of everybody who has spoken to this motion, and I will call for the vote, please, Madam Speaker. Honourable members, the call for the vote has been called. All those in favour of the motion signify by saying yay. Yay. All those against signify by saying nay. Honorable member, your motion has passed. Okay. Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, with your indulgence, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House revert to tabling of documents to allow the introduction of a command document. Shall it carry? Very good. Minister, Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, by command of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg to table orders in council, uh, exec EC 2023-30 and EC 2023-293, informing the Legislative Assembly of changes pursuant to Section 5 of the Public Departments Act and I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Well, Kerry. Okay. Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the first order of the day be now read. Shall so, carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. I move second by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty. Shall I carry? Honourable Member from Raldona and Deputy Speaker, please chair the Committee of the Whole.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Minister, do you want to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, can I bring a stranger on, please? Shall I carry? Carry. Do you remember where we were? I do. I took one book today. The number one thing I have to. Oh, <laughs> you're prepared today. Oh, boy. Uh, could you uh, introduce yourself for Hanser Kelly? Uh, yes, Kelly Bulger, Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, Director of Finance. Welcome, Welcome back. Yeah. Minister, it appears as though you have a significant stack of takebacks. I do. I'd like to table them. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Working hard. And, and I, I don't know if it's in that or not, but I talked to my staff about the, the state of the forest report, and we're going to have an update on where we are Hopefully, it'll be ready Friday. If not, it'll be early next week, and we'll release that whole. Minister of Action, indeed. Uh, they were scared of you guys, not me, so I keep asking questions. Should I even open the floor or just carry this? <laughs> Members, we are on page 62 of the Department of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. We uh, were debating the microbiology and chemistry laboratories. Uh, I had. Uh, the leader of the third party on my list. Would you like okay. to stay on the list? I just have one couple, uh, a couple of questions on leader this. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it's related to uh, the drinking water uh, testing. Victoria by the Sea, very small municipality, 100 or so folks, they have their own municipal water supply. It's unusual for a place that small, particularly out in the rural area. But um, it costs them a lot to monitor and keep their municipal water safe. And I'm wondering whether, because you know that can be a deadly situation. We've you know yeah. seen it in Walker and other places where the safety for drinking water is is critical, particularly in rural areas with you know a, a lot of uh, opportunity for fecal matter to get in there. And I'm wondering whether, for a smaller municipality like that, this centralized uh, chemical laboratory would be able to take on their regular water testing that they have to do to make sure that their system is safe because they just don't have the money to do that. Yeah, so I'll say yes, on a, like a preliminary yes. I'll go back and see if we can come up with a, I have to take this treasury board obviously and get it passed there, but see if we can come up with a, a set of guidelines that would match communities of a certain size. So yeah, just we'll work on that. I might start right away. That's my only question then, Chair. So the section carry. Sure. Agricultural Outreach, Appropriations Provided to Administer Pesticide Management Programs and the Agriculture Environment Officer Unit, Administration 6,300, Equipment 4,500, Material Supplies and Services 15,500, Professional Services 37,000, Salaries 312,000, Travel and Training 32,100, Total Agricultural Outreach 407,400. Are there any questions? Leader of the third party? Yeah, just a couple. Um, Approximately how many calls of the agricultural environment officers get in the course of a year? Like is that, and is it going up or down? I don't have prior year, but we do have uh, about 252 interactions. Um, it's 59 complaints, 148 inspections, and 45 for information. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thanks, Kelly. And again, you don't have any comparisons to let us know whether that's more or less than. You'll get them. Yeah. Okay. We'll bring them that's back, great. Yeah. Um, are they concerned only with pesticide management and they all, I mean we all know the issues that can arise from that or do they look at other environmental issues on farms as well? Well the, the matters they deal with um, are crop rotation, manure management, soil erosion carcasses, burning irrigation. Um, so they deal primarily with the agriculture industry. Yep. Leader of the third party. Right. I, I appreciate that, Kelly. So it is quite a wide range of environmental services beyond just checking for, for pesticides and stuff. Um, that's all I have for the section, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Environmental land management. Appropriations provided to administer and coordinate the environmental assessment and subdivision review process, environmental permitting, contaminated sites, oil spill response, and to administer Water Course and Wetland Protection Regulations, Administration 15,500, Equipment 7,700, Material Supplies and Services 8,100, Professional Services 65,800, 
salaries nine hundred and twenty three thousand travel and training forty eight thousand seven hundred grants eighty thousand total environmental land management one million one hundred and forty eight thousand eight hundred are there questions in this section leave to the third party um, so can you explain what the province's role is uh, with when you have an oil spill or a gas spill? I'm thinking here that there was a fairly large, although it was hard to discern exactly how bad it was, but gasoline spill on uh, University Avenue here in Charlottetown. So, like, what does the province do in cases like that, and who, like, where does the money come to clean that up? Is that, government, is that public funds? It would not necessarily be public funds. The landowner would be expected to fund that cost. We do have a small contingency in the budget if uh, the landowner was unable or unwilling to um, do the remediation. Okay. Leave the third party. Okay. I, I presume, obviously, if it's a government-owned facility or on Crown land, that would be different, it would it? be. It would be different, yes. Right. Yep. But in a situation like that, the one I just described, the cost would be incurred by the landowner. By the landowner, yes. Right. Okay. Lead to the third party. Thanks, Chair. Um, you know, there was a time, well, listen to me, it wasn't that long ago, where, you know, old oil tanks and spills and stuff was a, you would hear about that on a regular basis, and the costs associated with it were pretty awful. Um, we had the discussion today about the heat pump program and how people are getting off oil. And do we have any statistics on whether that is leading to a reduction in the number of contaminated spills we're having? I hope it is. I imagine it is. It's a good question. I mean, with the stat we use for heat pumps is it displaces a thousand liters of oil, so five thousand heat pumps is five million liters. So we mu it must be dropping, but we'll get the exact answer. Right okay, now. thank you. Leader of the third party. And the two thousand two two AG report had they raised concerns about the Park Street location, um, which had been previously housing the COVID testing clinic, and that's where the mobile shelters are now. Um, they found that the province had not conducted a stage two environment, phase two environmental assessment. Uh, now, I know that the previous Minister of Transportation said that it's a, I think, a very invasive assessment was the phrase that was used. But we don't know whether or not we did enough testing to know whether that site is clean or not. Does, do you know if you're planning to do a full phase two environmental testing on that site now that there are people actually living there? I think we did or started one, but I'll get I'll get the exact, exact answer right back. Okay. Leave okay. to the third party. Um, those are all my questions for this section. Thank Shall you, the Chair. section carry? Carry. Carry. Waste reduction, recovery, and recycling. Appropriations provided for operations of the beverage container program, the reduction of single-use products, and oversight of the extended producer responsibility program, administration 2,000, equipment 6,000, material supplies and services 7,564,500, salaries 179,400, travel and training 9,400, grants nil. Total waste reduction, recovery and recycling 7,761,300. Uh, Cheryl Tan West Charlotte? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, 300 salaries that it's um, there was la last year it was it was a much bigger forecast and we're down to um, it's come back in line. Was that for a special project? Or? We had funds planned for temporary support to support zero plastic initiatives. Um, I'm not entirely, to be honest, sure if we had actually some staff in that in that um, role, but that was our plan and our forecast when we did our third quarter in January. So you don't know if that program went? Uh, well, we do. The program Federal operates. Program. It operates, you know, within the department. But we, we had some additional resources that we were going to hire mm -hmm. um, temporarily. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure if we actually did. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, West Royalty. Thank you. And uh, are you going to? The minister was on record talking about uh, pricing changes with. Uh, Beverage containers, are we? Are, are you doing that, Minister? Are you forging ahead with that? Yeah, we're doing a study here right now to see how we can do it. I mean, we don't want to, we know that there's a lot of inflationary issues in the um, public right now, so we, by doing it, we're going to increase the cost of things at point of sale, but we're going to also, so we're not looking to take any money out of it. We're just looking to make it so that the amount of money you can get when you bring your bottles back is higher. See, we can encourage more people to take them back and and pick them up out of the ditches like they used to. So we're making sure we're trying to thread the needle here to make sure that we don't drive inflation further by doing it. 
Yeah, good. Charlton West Road. to hear that. And uh, just my final question on uh, material supplies and services. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And is it, I mean, in in this section, waste reductions is pretty important. I I get I get a lot of maybe complaints about the, the waste section. I don't know if that really applies here, timing and everything else. Um, can you tell me about the, about the province? I'm trying to put a bunch of questions into one. Um, but can you just talk a little bit about that? Are we are we investing enough? Are we are we where, where we need to be? So you're asking about the material supplies and services yeah. um, increase budget to budget. Exactly. So that will be for the beverage container program, um, just to recognize the increase in volume of returns, as well as um, because it's been about a six to seven percent higher um, than the prior year. So that's additional funds to support that. Okay. Just the last one. Are you surprised it's six or seven percent higher? Is that is no. that a reflection of population? No, it, it's been growing ever since. I think I have here since uh, just what year was that? Since 2018, 2019, there's been a 19 percent increase. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm good. Shall the section carry? Uh, Chair, just one question. Sure, leader of the third party. Regarding our move towards single use product products, and I'm wondering whether there's any particular funding in this in this uh, section for that and if you're what what new initiatives if any you're imagining yeah well, where are we with that I mean we're kind of we we're waiting on the feds that we're, to do it or do it as a whole country right and it might have been a mistake because we were I was prepared to do it a while back so I the, the best political answer I, I can give you is I'm going to ch check exactly where it is and if it's not where we think it should be then we're going to implement our own that's a very acceptable answer to me, Minister. Thank, Thank you, Chair. I'm good for the section. Shall the section carry? Very, very. Total environment and water, 13,471,500. Shall carry? Very. Okay. Sustainability, Office of Net Zero. Appropriations provided for the operation of the Office of Net Zero and the administration of initiatives to help the province meet its Net Zero target. Administration, 11,400. Equipment, 2,500. Material supplies and services, 36,400. Professional services, 202,000. Salaries, 1,062,300. Travel and training, 31,000. Uh, uh, grants, 41,510,500. Total office of net zero, 42,856,100. Uh, Chair Alton, West Royalty. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on salaries, um, I just want to ask the minister: Is this are we are, are we still doing the active transportation in this section? Yes. Yeah. I don't know if we, we salary people there or not. Do not we? the salary people, but the the active transportation fund is in this section. Okay. Um, so the fund is in this section, but the people are in transportation. Well, they're spread around. We have people dedicated to what transportation does, tourism does, through parks. So we. It's a conglomerate of government that um, brings forward recommendations, but the fund is here. Cheryl Dan West Road. Okay, so as as, as active transportation um, gets, we, we, the government's done a good job of doing the initial routes, and uh, I, I guess the maybe um, the easier routes potentially. N now they get a little bit more complicated, I think, within communities. Um, I've talked to the maybe the minister about that. Um, do I ask about the, the fund here or wait for another? Here, yeah, here? okay. Um, so just a couple is that in my community there's a there's there's a various amount of and I've talked to the minister about this on different occasions, but I, I might need some assistance to do a study. Is there any room in the active transportation um, fund to conduct a, a feasibility study for things like an underpass or talking about uh, using alternative? Alternative substances, if if if, if asphalt's not allowed yep. because of Napa designation, so I think the minister would know about that. Can, can he talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, well, absolutely. If you, that, so we fund municipalities or or groups. So any group or municipality can apply to the fund, and we'll fund it. Cheryl Town West Road. Um, so you fund them to do the to do the work or to do the study? Oh, yeah, do the we'll do the okay. study if you want. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And that's kind of the only question I have with the minister is just that I, I think it's a great exercise. Uh, I'm stuck to try to make everybody happy, I guess. I hear you. And uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll get the minister. 
<laughs> so, you know, like, get the minister to commit on record to have a meeting with me about my trail. My community. 100%. Yep. Great, Shall the section carry? Uh, Shell Town Victoria Park. Chair. Um, so the Atlantic provinces had been trying to reach a new carbon pricing agreement with the federal government, um, but our province's plan was rejected. I'm wondering if has that had any impact on the budget this year? I don't think so. Anymore. No, definitely not. We have a $17 million increase on our programs um, from the prior year. Sheldon, Victoria Bear. Thank you, Chair. And there's an underspend on grants in this section um, by more than $10 million. I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us what spending was done that was not planned. An underspend on grants? Sorry, overspend. Uh, oh, yeah, twelve million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say, I mean, my heart's gonna yeah. be. <laughs> you got the wrong minister. Yeah. We don't understand. <laughs> well, that was primarily the free heat pump program. Was ten million dollars of that, as well as the free insulation program was a small amount, and the free, um, the free hot water heater electrification program, and there was a number of other sort of additional increases and decreases overall. Yep. So we refuse to turn our programs off when we run out of money. We go back to Treasury Board to get more. Cheryl Tim, Victoria Perry. So that kind of answers my next question, but I didn't quite hear what you said. So a, like a big increase to funding, we don't have that the carbon levy revenues anymore. So I'm wondering how we do fund those programs now. I think you might have answered that, but I didn't hear what you said. I'm not entirely sure on the on the revenue side what the revenue projection is for the current year related, but this would be any additional would be provincial funding. Sheldon, Victoria Bear. Thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering if you can tell us what kind of uptake there's been on the rental property home heating loan program. We had a minor um, invoice from the finance PEI at year end for the interest portion. I would have to bring back the uptake overall since the inception, and I can certainly do that. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sheldon, Victoria Bear. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm wondering if we've had any success on getting residential landlords to start adopting heat pumps in their units. Has there been much success or uptake in that program? Uh, I'll have to check on that as well. Okay. Yep. Cheryl and Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there was uh, $308,000 spent on free home insulation program um, from 2022-2023. I'm wondering if you have increased uptake for that program in the wake of Fiona damage, and what we expect that uptake might be. The program just was implemented post Fiona, December or January, so um, we don't have any information prior to that on the free program. Sheldon, Victoria Fair. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the e-bike and bicycle rebate programs that were introduced I think it was last year. Um, have we seen an increase in the purchases there? Wondering at how this program is going. So we had on the e-bikes, we had um, 730 e-bike rebates since the since April 1st of last year, which was the first year of the program, and we had um, 2,827 bicycles um, rebates since the program started as well. Yeah. Cheryl, and Victoria Burr. Pretty good uptake there. It was. Yeah. Um, so there's an additional $5 million budgeted for 23-24 over what was forecasted for the last uh, fiscal year. Are these to go towards new programs or the expansion of current programs? So um, there's about $4 million new for clean tech initiatives. Um, that would include enhanced business programs. There is additional funds for the free heat pump program, the free insulation program, and the, the free hot water heater electrification program. And we have the, the home, le home heating loan program as well. So those are the additions overall. Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And uh, professional services was overspent last year by nearly twice the budget. Um, it was a net zero action plan it was produced under professional services. So why was that not done? What, what was that? 
they did a jurisdictional scan and there's still more work to be done, so they do intend to go out to RFP to seek a contractor to support the development of the, the action plan in fiscal 23-24. Cheryl Dunn, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the Bicycle Rebate Program Administration is also under professional services. Was the administration for that more than you had expected? No. Um, I believe we negotiated the cost to, for 23-24. So the costs you're seeing here in these costs are the cost to administer in 23-24. And so it's half as much as the cost in the prior year. So we negotiated that with our contractor, Summerhill. Cheryl Dan Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's also a line for organization and program planning. Can you tell us what that is? I'll have to bring that information back. Okay. Okay. Oh, I know what that is. Okay. We talked about it here a little bit yesterday about about is there um, redundancy and, and should it be all brought together? So we actually have a, we're working on a plan to, to bring it all together under one roof. Good chair, thank you. Shall the section carry? Sure. Leader of the third party. Uh, just a couple of questions on the carbon tax levy expenditures, because you're planning um, a partial carbon tax rebate program with about a quarter of the revenue from the carbon tax. So, will that rebate come under the grants in this section? Which I think is where the fossil fuel rebates currently are. Yes, it would be under grants. Through all, through all the complement of grant programs. Okay. Leader of the third party. And can you explain why you think that rebate is a good idea? Which one? The, the carbon rebate program. Yeah, it's just our, pro, like our program. I'm not sure I understand that. If you understand the question, you answer. Uh, um, well, just that most of them are, are return of, you know, are rebate programs to return carbon revenue. Um, right. You leave the third party? Yeah. Do, do you want more explanation yeah, you know what I'm trying to ask? Okay. So the carbon relief program um, is, you know, that was developed to, for government to help people deal with the rising cost of living, and I appreciate that. And um, But there's... There's other ways that we could help um, islanders other than subsidizing fossil fuels. So I'm wondering, which wouldn't give people a benefit to burning fossil fuels, so I'm wondering whether um, you, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll abandon this question. It's, uh, I kind of know what you're getting at. I don't know if it's, if it's in here. It's the one where we were, where we were artificially lowering the cost. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, that. you're su subsidizing fossil fuels. I'm not sure we have it anymore. I don't think we're allowed to. No. The new levy doesn't, like the new agreement doesn't allow it. No. That was the fight that we want to keep it in. That's why. So your plan was rejected. Yeah, that's why it was rejected. So now we don't have it anymore because we're not allowed to. Okay. These are your priority. You're pleased with that. I am pleased I with know. that. <laughs> you're pleased you lost the fight, Minister. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sometimes you lose. Everybody wins. <laughs> um, so do you have any sense of how much extra you're going to need to spend on these carbon programs to make up for the um, emissions that were being subsidized by that rebate? Boy, that's a very deep question. Yeah. I couldn't I, I, I get, I get to the answer, but... I, I, I realize there's a lot of math involved in that, yeah. but okay. Lead of the third party. So if I read this right, the, the, the carbon tax relief is going to be extended on to cruise ships, is that correct? And I'm wondering how much that costs us in terms of lost revenue. Yeah, I, that's not in here, but I'll get whatever information there is on that for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do the third party. Um, that's all I have for this section. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Energy and efficiency appropriations provided for development, implementation of energy initiatives, and for the operation of efficiency PEI which provides islanders with information, advice, and financial assistance to reduce energy consumption. 
Administration, 52,600. Equipment, 115,600. Material Supplies and Services, 772,900. Professional Services, 672,700. Salaries, 1,764,200. Travel and Training, 67,200. Grants, 32,911,100. Total Energy and Efficiency, 36,356,300. Leave the third party. Thank you. So again, I'm looking at the grants program. In the last section, it was overspent by over 10 million. Here, it's almost 10 million, and I'm wondering where those funds went. From last year's budget to last year's forecast. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. It was a combination of factors, primarily um, the energy efficient equipment rebate program, uh, solar rebate program. Those were the two most okay. significant um, additions. Okay. Leader of the third party. So when you when you have a program like that, are the limits on it like typically you would you, you go till the grant runs out unless there's some some good reason for that. So is this a situation where no matter how many people apply, we're going to provide them with the rebate, or like is there a limit Basi on that? We've basically been operating like that, like it, yeah. I'm also happy with that. Oh, that's an awful softball. Well, where do you, <laughs> just where do you cut it off? off? Is the problem like who do you tell? No, that's and, and everybody's doing it for their own reason. And and you know, there's companies out there that will solar, for example, will finance it for you, so you can do it at no cost to you. And it may be what somebody needs to stay in their home. Like uh, I don't really know, so it, it's hard to say. Well, you can't have it because we ran into money. And and I really like the program. I, I talked about it today. We have. 20 megawatts, yeah. so we have 20 megawatts of solar on route on roofs. In the summertime, our peak wow. load is like 160 megawatts. So we're producing a, a lot of our own electricity in the summer just on roofs. And if we get to a place where we can store it, either in in a home or in a substation, if we could store that daytime energy, we're going to move all, start moving quickly towards our own energy um, independence here. The other third party. So you, the figures you just gave there, so more than 10% of the summer peak load is covered by solar. Is there, is there an upper limit that you're looking at for that? Like, that's happened very quickly, that 10 or 12, 13% or whatever it is. But like, would you, how, how far can we take that? That's a good question. Storage is key. So, I mean, we could take it really far if we can get storage. The pro way the program is now that it impacts the rest of our ratepayers to have the, the program that we have. So we we obviously need to look at what a future program looks like that has at-home storage. At-home storage would be ideal. Leave the third party. So there's no thought of moving the plain devil's advocate here, that solar rebate program to a sort of means-tested thing as is, we did with heat pumps originally. I know the number's gone up, but is that something that you're going to continue to offer to anybody? It's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> part of what we're going through with our, um, the road show that we have going now for our energy blueprint is to look at what future energy policy needs to look like so that we're not having a negative impact and that we're not creating energy poverty. So. I'm hopeful that, the, that there'll be answers come out of that that will help direct how these programs should work and what programs we should have or shouldn't have. Leader of the third party. One of the limiting factors here is uh, pushback from Maritime Electric, whether that's on the size of an individual um, system uh, or perhaps the total, you know, how, how, what percentage of uh, can we go to? Are you are you having to constantly negotiate with Maritime Electric on what those limits are? Because that would affect the, the funding of this program. No, we're pretty, we have a pretty good groove in there right now where, I mean, I think we're closer to being on the same page than we ever were. Okay. Um, Jason, I really like Jason, who's the president. He's, we have a good relationship, and I'm pretty honest with what my approach is, and he is honest in return so we're able to find a way that we can make our we can continue to move the way we want to move for islanders and uh, keep their buy-in so that it doesn't have a negative impact like we've seen lead of the third party so what currently is the is the limit for a, uh, a 
a single house or a business. It's like so many kilowatts, I can't remember what it yeah, is. Yeah, I don't remember what it is, but it's 100 kilowatts. Any, any install can't be above 100 kilowatts without right. the written approval of the minister. Right. That's the way the current law is written. Okay. Chair? Leave the third party. So one of the initiatives, and I fully support you in this, is the community solar arrays that you've talked about. And I know there's a couple of communities in my district that are considering that. But 100 is not really big enough for them to, or uh, a net zero school, for example, 100 is, no. is, makes that impossible for them. So are you pushing Maritime Electric to remove that limit, or does the veto, not veto, but does that ability that you have to sign off on something above 100 remove that concern? Yeah, so we're going to change our legislation to do so we can allow it. Okay. Leave the third party. So is that, that's not on the order paper for this sitting, is it? No, because that's the blueprint that we're doing the road show on, so that's coming in the fall. Okay. Yeah. All right. We've okay. also looked at other types of legislation that aren't on the order paper either, like the need for social enterprise yep. legislation, so we have a draft for it, and we're just trying to find where it belongs, but um, it was done ex for this energy transition piece. Okay. Leave it there, Greg. So can you tell me about the home energy assessments? Like, is that, how, how, that's in the section, I guess, is it? And how, how, is that done by the staff or is that sort of farmed out to companies that, that, we, that then bill us? It's farmed out. Yes, it's it is. It's completed out. by contractors, yes. Okay, yeah. all right. I think um, they have to have a national certification to get it by the federal government. Right. To do it. Leave the third party. And how much? Yeah, either. Yeah, no, I think I have to. They have to have that completed before they can do a. They're allowed to do the assessments. And how much does one of them typically cost? I presume it's different for each house, but. Oh, I, I think know. the pre and the post are slightly different costs. I'd have to bring the exact back, and I can do that. Right. Because I think one point is it one point four million. Uh, that's in the that's in the handout, but I don't have. That was our fiscal 22-23 cost. Right. Yeah. That would be the component that is connected to the um, home insulation program. There's a, a, also a piece that's connected to the new home construction program, um, but that's encompassed in the new home construction um, amount that's provided on the handout. Okay. All right. We'll leave um, the third party. Can you tell me what the what the home comfort program is like their names are quite similar and i'm just not sure what that is that was our low income program okay yes yeah. Yeah. so we're we're basically blending a lot of our programs now are just free anyway so right yeah leader of the third party can you explain is that is that to allow better insulation and new windows and stuff like caulking around stuff yeah. so all the stuff that we're doing for free with their free programs we were kind of doing for free before but they were, they were means tested using um, social developments, means testing. That's the one where we were, we, were, we had discussions in here before about are we using the right numbers? So we just changed and we went to this new way of doing it. We keep stepping it up and yeah. it helps us accelerate our transition too. Yeah, no, no, it's great. Leave the third party. Thank you. And it, that works well for people who are homeowners, of course. And I'm wondering whether there, there's any way that you have, maybe it is already incorporated, and excuse me for my ignorance on this, for people who are renters or landlords to give them an incentive and then pass that on to the folks who live there, perhaps. Yeah, so the issue we have is the passing it on part. Yeah, so we're I trying know. to be careful that we don't create yeah. wealth, wealth uh, I guess, by unintended consequences. So how do we make sure it gets passed on was is part of the issue that we're wrestling with. Right. Yeah. Hard to monitor. Leave the third The large scale uh, greenhouse gas reductions cost again about one point four million I think. Can you how much of a reduction did we achieve with that? Uh, no, I don't have that with me, but I can bring that information back. Leave the third party. So again, and maybe you don't have this information either, Kelly. But I mean, there's a lot of money here going to uh, efficiency and getting us to net zero. And I love that, of course. I'm 
fully supportive of that. Um, but I'd love to know what it's not. It's not really how much money we spend; it's how effective, how effectively we're spending that. So, do we have any figures on? I know we spoke about this yesterday. I think, and you mentioned that most of the data that we get comes from the federal government. Do we, but do we have any sense of what we've accomplished with the forty million or so that we're spending in this department? I don't have the information with me, but I can have the program compile it and bring it back. Okay. The other third party? Yeah, and that's cr critical, of course, because, you know, we're trying to get to net zero by a very specific point in time, and it would be good to know whether we're on track, whether we're ahead of the game, whether we've got catch-up to do it. Unless we have those figures, we've really no idea. So I, I, I look forward to seeing that. How, so how are we... Fi final question, Chair. How... Are, how are we measuring? Like, like, what metrics are we using, and how do we know whether we're on track or not? That's a good question. I'll get you the tactical answer, but I'll give you the political answer. <coughs> um, basically, we we know that some of this transition we do we're doing are, will directly reduce our greenhouse, like our heat pump program, or right. like a, our island transit program and stuff. We know that it will lead to reduced emissions. Right now, we wait for the federal inventory, which, like I said yesterday, we struggle with, but not having the full control yeah. over all of the data. But it's a move that we're uh, looking to make. And we have our FPT meeting is in July in Ontario, and I just found out the federal minister's not going to be there. So I'll have to, uh, he's at the G7, I think, at that time. So, which is also good for Canada, but I'll have to find another time to meet with him and stay on this issue because we can't accurately measure unless we can measure all, all the time, at least quarterly, in my opinion. Final, final question. <laughs> the third party. Thank you. Um, and this is something, presumably, we don't have to go alone on figuring this out, but uh, we know that some refunds, grants, rebates, incentives that governments offer are more efficient in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. For example, EV rebates are actually not that not even close. No. You pay a lot of money for a small reduction, whereas other things are, you know, you get a much bigger bang for your buck, if I can put out a bad analogy to use when you're talking about uh, climate change. But um, do we know where, if where we're putting the money, it's a complicated question, if the places we're putting our money are the places where we're getting the most effective results <coughs> per dollar? Well, and, and I mean, I guess I would, what I would say on that is most effective results is open to interpretation because some of the things like the e-rebate -re -re isn't intended to switch everybody to EVs. We'd actually rather you on the bus if we had. So that's our real plan. It, some of these things are more like advertisements for change. So we have these programs and people are switching over to these new technologies that we can, that, that we help grow the knowledge of islanders to what we're trying to do. So so is it effective to reducing our emissions? No, I would agree with you 100%. Is it effective to have to start a conversation? I would say yes, and you probably found this election knocking on doors. You heard more about EVs than ever before, and I would be the same. So I think that we've created a conversation. So, so maybe the money created a conversation that will help us do things later on that are going to be harder. Appreciate that. I'm good. Thank you, Chair. So the second carry. Total sustainability seventy nine million two hundred twelve thousand four hundred shall carry. Total Department of Environment, Energy and Climate Action one hundred one million seven hundred twenty thousand two hundred shall carry. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Kelly. Your deputy whip.
Minister, are you good to go? I don't need to do anything. Uh, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. I'd like to bring shall, a stranger on the shall floor. Carry? Carry. Members, we are moving on to the Department of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. And we are starting on page uh, 92 under Corporate Services. Could you introduce yourself for Hansers? Yep, my name is Shannon Burke and I'm a Director of Finance and Corporate Services. Welcome back, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Corporate Services. Appropriations provided for, or, sorry, Minister, do you have anything you wish to table before we start? Yes, I have the handouts. Thank you, Minister. Appropriations provided for operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister and centralized administrative functions for the Department. Administration, 20,200. Equipment, 1,600. Material supplies and services, 25,600. Professional services, 8,400. Salaries, 573,700. Travel and training, 16,700. Total corporate services, 646,200. Any questions? Leave the third party. Uh, so this is a, a big department with a sort of wide range of responsibilities, and I'm, I guess my first question is: Can you tell us a bit about the makeup of the department and how you are sort of managing your priorities given how many things are going on? That's a good question. It's a uh, yeah, fisheries, tourism, sport, and culture. It's a uh, and rural development as well. Also falls on. It's just not in the title. Um, and it might be a smaller budget in terms of money-wise, but it uh, fisheries and tourism are two of our primary industries, which are which drive our economy. So um, I've actually it's uh, it's been quite busy and I don't doubt uh, it. trying to focus my attention on all the all the files. Yeah. Leave the third party. That's so interesting that rural development isn't even. It's included here, but it isn't even mentioned. That was a whole department by itself in a previous administration, if I remember correctly. It was a in title only then. <laughs> Be the last. <laughs> <laughs> Just a title, bro. <laughs> Didn't minister without portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The third party. Uh, th I'm fine. That's really all I had for this section. So the section carry. Total corporate service. <laughs> Yeah. Total corporate services, 646,200, shall carry. Marine fisheries and seafood services. Seafood services, appropriations provided for the effective delivery of information and product and market development programs for both the commercial fishing industry and seafood products. Administration, 3,000. Equipment, 1,500. Material supplies and services, 53,300. Professional services, 404,000. Salaries, 270,800. Travel and training, 29,500. Grants, 413,800. Total seafood, seafood services, 1,175,900. O'Leary and Burdess. A little bit of an update on this Candace Food Island cookbook. I know the previous minister was uh, advocating it for it in a big, big way, and you've got, uh, what, $20,000 into that and another 7,500. Just uh, fill me in on what you've got back for that investment, and uh, or is it just something that you give to dignitaries that arrive here? <laughs> we'll take that back. Well, they were in Verdes. Uh, well, too, it's too bad we couldn't get a little more enlightenment on that one. Uh, um, I guess the other one, I uh, was just wondering on the fall flavors is another section there that, uh, how's, that how's that been going? We're, we've got, uh, I think, 15,000 in the promoting fall flavors. I, I, I know I was a big advocate for it. And uh, one, one event that uh, I know hasn't happened recently has been the, uh, the lobster on the beach at West Point. You, can you say that again, member? So on, under the fall yeah. flavors, it says here 15000 to the Food Island Partnership for a, the celebration of 2022 fall flavors. And I noticed that the lobster and the beach hasn't happened in the last little bit. Is there any chance that that's going to be resurfaced? Or what, 
can you give me an update on the promotion of that, and how, how are fall flavors distributed across the island? So really, I think we're down to just one in the west now called Sip and Slurp. So most of those projects are led by Food Island Partnership, and we would fund, we do core funding for them, but we also do project funding. So they would come to us when they have particular projects, and we, we would contribute in the form of a grant. So um, we could definitely see, see what their plans are for the upcoming year and what would be included in that. Larry and Bernice. So, so as minister responsible for the rural development side of the equation, this is where I think you do, you should have a little bit of a say in what's going on here, and see that these events are distributed across the island. And I say, I just my observation uh, from my time to now is that we're down to one event in uh, Western PEI, and that's the the sip and slurp in Alberton. And uh, well, I'm sure it's a fine event. Uh, we used to have the. You know, toe taps of taters. We used to have uh, the uh, the uh, lobster on the beach, and uh, I think there's uh, there might be one in Atlantic Island. I think there's a new one that has been created in Atlantic Island Indigenous food. But anyway, I just I just seem to see a decline there, and I'd like to. Uh, I think you need as minister responsible for rural development have a little bit of input into encouraging these organizations, who tend tend to be sometimes central driven, to make sure that they are fulfilling their mandate from a rural development perspective as well. Yep, no, it's a good point, member. I can look into that. I have a question, Minister. This is the section where the future fishers? Yes. Um, that the uh, PIFA... Uh, I think it's the next one, member. This is the next one? Oh, that's good. Anyway. Yeah, that's fine. Um, at the most recent uh, PIFA uh, AGM, um, I believe there was a motion put forward about the amounts, uh, given that the increased uh, cost of, of fleets and that kind of thing. Is there any uh, thoughts on increasing the uh, amounts of, of bursaries or grants that go out in the future fishers program, given the increased uh, costs of uh, fleets? So you mean like the 10000 that The rebate for the... The rebates for the uh, for the the programs and then the uh, forgive or the uh, the interest relief I think is, is what it is whatever your programs yeah. are. Yeah. The, uh, well, the issue is the price of t for a license has gone way up, so it's probably not as enticing anymore. So we have we have talked about it. Um, I can't say, say for sure if it, it will happen, but we have discussed it. Um, I think the number of applicants has gone down, but it kind of fluctuates year to year. Um, we've, I think we found lately that people aren't selling as much right now, probably because in some areas they're doing quite well, so they're kind of holding on to their license, but it kind of it depends on the year. Um, I had uh, three fishers that would look and geek into it, and of course they're looking for every avenue possible. Not that this is a, you know, significant in the big scheme of things, but every little bit helps once they, they are able to access it. So thank you for looking into that. Uh, shall uh, Seafood Services uh, lead the third party? Thanks, Chair. There's a big increase here in professional services, like it's ten times what it was last year. Can you explain what that is? Uh, well, that's money to kind of help rebuild from Fiona. So we own a, a hundreds of slips across the island. We also own a few wharves, not many, most are owned by DFO, but um, we're going to go out and assess all of these areas and this will be used to help repair some of them. I know the one, like for instance, the one in North River and the Causeway is heavily damaged, and yep. the fire department uses that slip, and they can't use it right now. So um, we're going to look at a number of those areas and see if we can repair them. Okay. So just so I'm clear on that, Minister, the four hundred thousand is for assessment of damage and also capital repairs to it. Well, the, the, yeah, these would these. Hopefully, in most cases, will be minor. I know, like extensive repairs would have to be under capital. Right. Yeah. Leave the third party. Okay. Um, there's also a hundred thousand dollar grant increase, and I'm wondering Please. what that is going towards. Uh, we have an additional hundred thousand um, that was added to the budget, and for 23-24 to enhance promotional marketing activities related to island fisheries products. 
Neither the third party. So is that for anything specific? You know, is that we're talking mussels or oysters or lobster? Or? I think all-encompassing. Um, and, and the hope is to expand into new markets. Okay. Okay, Chair. Neither the third party. Thanks. Uh, I know that... Uh, um, maybe it's not mandated yet, but an e-log for lobster landings and reporting has, you know, is coming in or has come in. Uh, where are we with the development and the implementation of that? Um, maybe I could ask the chair. Sorry. Um, so we, we have an agreement with the PEI Fishers Association. Um, right now and we are providing funding to them. We have provided some funding in fiscal 22-23 and you'll see in the next section where there's additional funding to to help make sure that that's implemented by the 2024 deadline. Okay. Neither third party? Right, so it's next year is the time when it has, it has to be, all boats have to have it. Okay. So you mentioned that the next section has a portion of the funding for that? Okay. So this um, what we're seeing this year is that just is that just a one-year contribution, or are we going to see that in subsequent years as well? So I believe the agreement is a hundred thousand in twenty-two, twenty-three. There's a hundred thousand next fiscal, and then fifty the year after. Okay. Leave the third period. Thank you. And will that be sufficient to install the e-log in all the lobster craft on PEI? I believe the the funding is developed, yeah, to develop the app that the Fishermen's Association would make available to all the all the lobster fishers. Okay, so again, this is my own interest in uh, in figuring this out. So the the department will provide the app develop develop and provide the app, and then the fishers have the equipment on their boats that they will be able to use the app with. Is that how this is going to work? I believe so. Yeah, we're we're provided. The Fishermen's Association is wants to develop the app in house on their own. They want to. Uh, so we're the former minister um, provided said that he would provide assistance with that to help develop that app. So this is a continuation of that. Okay. Yeah. Chair, the third party and would. Would a typical lobster boat already have the whatever electronic equipment they're going to re require to run that app on, or is there going to be an expense there as well? Be their phone. Excellent. Any the third period? I, I'm good. That's all I have for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shaw Kerry. Chair Kerry. Marine Fisheries and Regulatory Services. Appropriations provided for the operation of services associated with seafood buying and processing as prescribed by the Fisheries Act and the Fisheries Inspection Act. This section also supports the commercial fishing industry through strategic research, science, and advocacy. Administration, 5,600. Equipment, 300. Material supplies and services, 30,500. Professional services, 4,800. Salaries, 470,500. Travel and training, 43,400. Grants, 1,985,400. Total marine fisheries and regulatory services, 2,540,500. Questions? Olary and Burness. Uh, just on uh, a couple of questions, I guess. So one is around uh, inspectors that you have for our seafood processing plants. How many inspectors do you do you have? Because I know just my time, it was a bit of a challenge in trying to get around to all the inspect all the plants, and uh, sometimes there'd be complaints, and uh, you know, trying to catch somebody in the act is always a challenge sometimes. So we have two. We have two. two. Larry and Burness. So we have two for all of Prince Edward Island, for all of the processing plants. And I would argue that you've probably got more processing plants now than you've ever had in some time. Do, do you feel that that's enough? I haven't heard any concerns from my staff that it's not enough. But if they feel like they need more, then I'm more than willing to support them. Larry and Burness. I, I, I'm certainly not too concerned about whether your staff are concerned. I'm, I'm more concerned about... Uh, the uh, <coughs> Islanders, I guess, when we're dealing with issues around odors and smells and the way, you know, way uh, interactions are occurring on the, at these, some of these facilities. Um, so 
So I, just, I guess that's where I'm kind of coming from. So are you getting any uh, complaints from any areas or people in the communities? I know I, I, I get some from, from my constituency on, on certain particular plants, and, and it's mostly just from an older, older perspective, but. I haven't had any complaints personally, but. Or well, Larry Inverness. Okay, well, no, I just, I just, that was one. I have more questions on other parts of this, but if anybody. Shall that carry? Uh, third leader, third party. What sorts of regulatory activities that are provided under this section? What, what, what do you regul, what do you regulate? So this section would be responsible for the PEI Fisheries Act and the Fisheries Inspection Act. So the regulations held within those. Okay. Leader the third party. So we had an incident earlier this year with a right whale in LFA 24 and uh, is there any, I know there's been changes in gear and I know that's coming in slowly and it's not mandatory currently as I understand it, but is that the sort of thing that would be regulated by your department here? No, it would fall under DFO. That's all DFO. Leave it through, Barry. So I, I know it, it, it's written here and you just said it's under the Fisheries Act and the Fisheries Inspection Act. Can you tell me what sorts of things are a provincial responsibility for regulating and monitoring? I am, uh, I'm fairly new to the department as well, but um, the things that I'm aware of would be the, the licensing, um, of, like buyer's license, processor's licenses, and those sorts of things. Okay, all right. Lead to the third party. So typically in a department you'd have um, regulatory activities, like things that regulate and then uh, supports and advocacy for the industry and they would be sort of kept separately because they're you know they're they're not working against each other but they're certainly separate entities and I'm wondering why they are contained within the same department here do you mean in terms of grants and right so sorry. yeah I'm, so I guess I'm I'm wondering how you ensure that the regulatory activities are sort of properly separated from the supports and the advocacy work that's that's here as well, just to make sure that things are impartial and properly managed. That's a fair question. We'd have two inspection officers. So you're, are you saying how are they? How are we separate? Not not them necessarily, but any regulatory. Yeah. Uh, is it the same people who are providing the regulation who are also providing the supports? No. No, they're different different parts of the department. Okay, that's I guess that's the way I should have asked the question to start with. Um, is is there anything in this department that again I suspect this is DFO work, but the moderate livelihood fishery and the Mi'kmaq fishery is that anything that comes under provincial jurisdiction at all? No, no, that's purely no, that's DFO. The yeah. third party. Uh, I'm good. That's all I have for this section. Olary and Vernes. Um, yeah, just uh, so I just to correct it. So actually, you, you, the province does have something to do with any any uh, seafood products that are once landed on the wharf are responsibility of the province, not the federal government. Just to <laughs> add into that, uh, on the future Fisher program, uh, I see in your budget that you've uh, didn't spend your money last year in the future Fisher program. You're going back to the same amount the previous uh, as budgeted. Uh, how's that program working? And I see you're at 52. Uh, Participants, do you anticipate more people getting into that particular program in the coming year? Because my understanding is the gears are getting tighter and tighter to get, and you also have the federal government involved with uh, the purchase of uh, gears in LFA 24. So I'm just wondering, is, is that a realistic number to have 185400 for the Future Fisher Program? And I'm thinking, are there ways that we can expand the Future Fisher Programs? We, we just I just had a good conversation with the chair <laughs> on this um, it just depends on how many applicants there are to the program right in some years there's quite a few and some years it goes down um, we just keep the budget line the same no matter depending on what it is right sometimes there's large uptake sometimes there's not um, I think we probably do have to look at perhaps expanding it a bit to make it a little more attractive because um, it as I said to the chair, obviously the price of a license has gone 
uh, a lot higher, so um, to make it enticing for. Yeah. Call the hour. Saved by the bell. The hour has <laughs> been called. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall it carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the Committee of the Report be adopted. Shall I carry? Yes. The hour has been called. The Honourable Member from Kensington Mulpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, seconded by Rustico Emerald, that this House adjourn until Thursday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Shall I carry? Yes. Good evening, everyone.